Welcome into Yahoo Finance Live. We've got some breaking news here. The latest data on inflation coming through right now. I'm bringing in some of these numbers here that we're seeing. We're looking at CPI on a month over month basis coming in up four tenths of a percent. That was a cooling here from the prior reading that we got, but still coming in a little hotter than what the street expected. That core month over month print coming in at three tenths of a percent growth in line with what the street was looking for. Now on a year over year basis, we're looking at CPI a 3.7 percent, so a bit higher there. Core CPI at 4.1 percent, so a bit of improvement uh, from what we saw the prior month here, Brad. But of course, the big question for the street right now is what this means for the Fed, whether or not it's enough to justify staying on the sideline. Taking a look at the reaction in futures right now, we're still looking uh, like we're uh, like we're going to be looking at gains here at the open with Dow futures still up just over 100 points. Yeah, some of the color around this report, the index for shelter is still the largest contributor to the monthly all items increase. Stop me if I sound like a broken record, but that is something that we've continued to track month over month here. But here's where it also gets interesting, even though that accounted for over half of the increase here, an increase in gasoline index, also a major contributor to the all items monthly rise. Major energy component indexes were mixed in September the energy index that rose one and a half percent over the month food index that increased two tenths of a percent in September as it did the prior two months as well the report noting here and then additionally you think about what this all means for food as well the index for food at home that increased one tenth of a percent over the month while the index for food away from home people continuing to eat out a little bit more that's up by about four tenths of a percent in this report yeah, certainly. And judging by the market's reaction, it's going to be critical here to see as the street begins to digest these numbers. But still, when you take into account the fact that that headline number there coming in a bit hotter than expected, a 3.7 percent year over year rise, more than what the street was bracing itself for, 3.6 percent. You got to question whether or not that might be enough for the Fed to act again before the end of the year. And you could see we're racing some of those gains right now with the Dow futures up just about 85. But certainly some of these numbers here a bit worrisome for the Fed, also for uh, forecasters out there, market watchers, just in terms of what this could mean for the future of Fed policy. Absolutely. And for more on this latest inflation read, we're joined by Yelena Maliev, who is the KPMG senior economist, and Jeffrey Kleintop, Charles Schwab, chief global investment strategist. Great to have you both here with us this morning. Elena, I want to start with you. You take a look at and, and hear of these figures. What does this set up, not just for the Fed calculus, which, of course, many of the investors are going to kind of pair this with, but ultimately what the pathway of inflation looks like? Uh, I would say that overall this is a very good report in that the core figure is continuing to decelerate. We know that food and energy prices tend to be volatile any given month, and we did see a jump in energy prices in September and then a cooling in October. So we will see that in next month's report. But overall, shelter inflation is still very high. It has been coming down in the real world, in the market uh, rents. We have seen them start to decelerate since last year, so that will eventually show up in the CPI data simply because of how lagged the data is. But overall, I would say this is heading in the right direction. Uh, we know there's volatility ahead, but I would say this is an overall good report. Jeffrey, what do you think? Do you agree? Uh, no, I, I can't agree with this. I, I, I think the, the market was braced for a hotter report after a hotter PPI yesterday and a hot jobs report on Friday. So the initial reaction to this number may be muted, but inflation is proving to be stubborn, and that's likely to weigh on markets in Q4. CPI coming in at 3.7% is the third straight month without a decline. And that may shake confidence that inflation is steadily continuing to recede. And more importantly, core inflation in the 0.3% range for the past two months annualizes at a pace well above the Fed's 2% target. The PMI price component, that's the Purchasing Managers Index pricing assessment, continues to point to a stubborn outlook for CPI, lingering in this 3 to 4% range above the Fed's target over the coming six months. So the market's confidence that we may see rate cuts next year uh, or, or even uh, uh, an end to QT, I think is uh, uh, really proving to be misguided here. Jeff, just to stay with that thought for a hot second here. So if you think about what the Fed has to digest, in, in, and we just got their meeting minutes yesterday from the most previous meeting, how does this change the discussion going into that November meeting? 
Well, not only is inflation proving to be relatively stubborn here, we've got some upside risks. We know the Israel-Hamas conflict will likely be a topic of discussion at that meeting. That holds upside inflation risks. And as, the, as does the weather-related supply chain backups we are seeing around the world related to the El Nino. We've got a real backup here in the Panama Canal. We've now got uh, ships being restricted as they go through not only how loaded those ships can be, but the number of ships coming through that canal. That's creating potential supply chain problems. Maybe these issues are transitory, maybe not. What I can tell you is the Fed is going to be focused, if not continuing to hike rates, they're going to be focused on continuing QT. Quantitative tightening, that unwinding of quantitative easing is going to be a major focus of discussion. And as that continues, financial conditions are going to continue to tighten in the U.S. and around the world. And we know historically, those have not been good conditions for the stock market. And Yelena, going off of what Jeffrey uh, was just saying there, just in terms of how the Fed is going to be thinking about this report, what this means for policy here going forward, how do you see the Fed walking that balance here or trying to balance the fact the risk of over-tightening versus not doing enough? Because, yes, in some aspects we are making uh, some headway on inflation, but still in this report many items here proving that inflation remains extremely sticky. This is true. Inflation does remain sticky. The fact that it's been decelerating, I think, is the, the most important part of, of the focus of the Fed. But we do not expect the Fed to cut anytime soon. We don't expect them to hike either because we've seen that the long bonds, the bond market has been doing a lot of the tightening for the Fed over the last few months. And so the expectation that conditions will remain tight, especially in the credit market, uh, will help cool demand and cool some of that spending into the end of the year, especially student loan payments get resumed, especially as folks have been pivoting from spending on stuff, uh, instead spending on services like travel and dining out. And so we do expect to see this cooling down, especially when I, I mentioned the shelter index, the rents coming down in many parts of the country as more apartments uh, get built. And so there is an expectation that the Fed is going to hold and wait. And in the world where we have higher growth prospects with GDP being revised up, uh, we do expect that in a world with higher growth prospects, it's also a world of higher rates. Elena, following up on what you just said, when you talked about the surge that we've seen in bond deals, I think a big question here is how much pressure that is going to put on the economy. What are your expectations there? It will definitely continue to put pressure on the housing market. We have seen the mortgage rate uh, flirt with that 8% figure. That's incredibly huge compared to what you saw last year. And so these tightening of credit conditions, these higher bond rates are going to cool demand in the very interest rate sensitive sectors like housing. Now, many folks are locked in into fixed rate mortgages and, and have pretty uh, good credit standing, and so it's not going to affect everybody, but we've already started to see a lot of that cooling coming in the housing market uh, in terms of demand for mortgages at this time. Jeff, you know, as we think out to next year and, and the likelihood of a cut, what would the Fed need to see? Would the Fed need to continue to enact policy until they get towards 2%, or do you believe that they can sit at 3% and perhaps start to feel like, okay, the job's been accomplished, even if they didn't get all the way down to flat 2%. Maybe it's a two-handle that we're looking at. I think that probably is going to be a discussion within the Fed, but I think they've lost enough credibility that uh, before they say 3% is good enough, they need to get a little closer to 2 and I think that's going to prove to be very hard to do. And the market... I guess it's just convinced that they're going to cut no matter what. And I, I'm often uh, reminded of the Mark Twain quote, it, it ain't the thing that you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's the thing you know for sure that just ain't so. The market is sure the Fed is going to be cutting rates next year. They are done 90% confidence priced into the futures market they'll be cutting rates next year. While I believe it's possible, I don't share that same degree of confidence. And if the market reassesses that stance in light of more data like today's CPI report, it can move the market sharply since everyone seems to be on the same side of the boat. Trevor, take a look at the bond market's reaction to this. We are seeing some upside here on the two-year Treasury yields. Not too much movement on the 10-year. But if, in fact, this points to the, to the fact that maybe the Fed is not done or maybe the fact that we could see a little bit more of a, of a move to the upside here in yields, I guess how much more of a move to the upside are you potentially seeing in the 10-year? 
That's it's so hard to say. Already we've seen such an incredible move that it's difficult to say how much more we get from here. What's probably more important is that rates may remain relatively high from here. We we just talked a little bit about the negative implications that can have for the economy. Already we're feeling that at the smaller business level. And I think as we go through the earnings season here, you're gonna hear this from a number of businesses as well. It's become more costly to implement those capital expenditures and hiring. I think the job market could begin to soften up later this year as we see more services industries uh, reflecting this very tight credit environment, not tight credit environment, but more costly credit environment. It's often not, uh, uh, it's not the, the, the demand picture that's, the, that's a problem at the moment. It's more that the cost of investing in these things is becoming uh, more of a challenge for these businesses. I think that'll be a theme running through the earnings season. And then just lastly here, Yelena, a final word to you. When you think about now going into the holiday season for any consumer that is out paying close attention perhaps at 8.30 a.m. as we are to this CPI print and, you know, has a few more of these prints prior to the depth of the holiday season. Is there any kind of fatigue that consumers are, are starting to show with regard to recession discussion, recession fears, concerns? Definitely, because remember, as we're paying attention to inflation, which is the change in prices, consumers are facing the actual level of prices, which are still high compared to a year ago and rising. So there's definitely fatigue from the high price levels, the need to uh, want to see friends and family over the holidays, costs are still high for those things. And so there is definitely a concern in terms of the consumer's perspective of how much longer do we have to face these high prices. But in May of this year, we started to see average hourly earnings actually start outpacing inflation. So folks are getting some of that real purchasing power back, albeit slowly. And so there is still a lot of income out there growth and a lot of uh, job growth as well. So folks are, you know, feeling confident in that regard. But in terms of spending, there's definitely going to be a cooling, especially the student loan payments come back online. Lena, what's your base case on whether or not we'll see a recession? Right now, we're putting it at about 25% for the next 12 months. All right, Yelena Maliev of KPMG Senior Economist and Jeffrey Kleintop, Charles Schwab, Chief of Global Investment Strategist. Thanks to you both for helping us break down the CPI print. Thank you. Well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be back 9 a.m. Eastern time. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, let's talk about the latest on EVs because EV charging stations are in high demand and the industry is racing to keep up. The number of charging ports in the national station locator was 3.2% in the first quarter. And that's expected to continue to climb. But range anxiety is still prevalent amid fear that the charging infrastructure is far short of what's necessary for wider EV adoption. Here to talk about that, we want to bring in Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO, as well as Joel Levin, Plug in America Executive Director. Great to have you both here with us today. Joel, let me start with you. Plug in America, for those who aren't familiar, it's a nonprofit that promotes the use of EVs. I'm curious from your perspective, how would you describe the current state of the charging network here in the U.S.? Well, um, it, it's a mix. Uh, you know, most people charge at home uh, and they use the charging network mainly for longer trips. Uh, the public charging network, EV drivers are not very happy with it. Uh, there's, uh, We did a survey this year uh, that showed that drivers are generally dissatisfied with the public charging network. The Tesla network, on the other hand, where about half of EV drivers drive Teslas, people are pretty happy with the Tesla network. So um, it's sort of a mixture of the two. Um, the federal government is in the process of rolling out their NAVI program that would create uh, charging along major highways along the whole US and the the standards for NEBI are pretty robust. And so if they're able to implement that program as it's designed, we think that public charging should improve a lot over the next couple of years. Brendan, how, how significant is it that you have more auto manufacturers that are deciding, okay, we can all kind of use Tesla as, as a standard here. And what does that mean for adoption, especially when you think about the network that we have right now and, and vehicle owners just trying to make sure that they're gonna have the ability to charge anywhere they need to, regardless of what type of, of plug that they've got? Yeah, it, it's really not a very relevant statistic. And, and the meaning, what we mean by that is the EV industry globally has structurally adjusted. In the U.S., Tesla is a bit of a phenomenon in terms of the charging network, but in Europe, the Tesla standard is banned. So what that means is the folks that develop cables and connectors, they've matured independently. And it's not a big issue to put a NAX, as what Tesla calls that standard uh, cable and connector onto a charger. We've done it. We've done it successfully. That version of a charger for Blink goes into production in November and December this year. So that's not really a big issue. And what we really need to focus on is what the charging world demands. And according to McKinsey, according to Price Cooper's Waterhouse, Bloomberg, and a multiplicity of other surveys, the dominant amount of charging takes place on L2 charging, 90 plus percent. And this statistic has not waned over the last 15 years since I've been doing this. So we, we expect that. When we talk about DC fast charging, that's for those exceptional trips. That's for when you're going on the quarter, you're going to grandma's house, and that represents 90% or less. So we have two th things that are challenging us. First, we have to say that the standards issue is not a big deal. The industry will take care of that. And secondarily, that we have to break the dominant paradigm of charging and saying you don't have to go to depot or fueling station. You can charge at work, you can charge at home, you can charge at your doctor's office or the grocery store. Brendan, how confident then are you that the infrastructure can keep up with EV adoption? When we talk about what this is going to look like five, 10 years from now, what do you think the charging networks could potentially look like? Yeah, so if you look at what we need, and this is at 35% penetration by 2030, right? So California is actually at 23% EV penetration. We need about 30 million chargers out there in both private and public. The split's about 28 uh, million of those need to be in private situations, that's multifamily dwelling, private garages, in, in in-home. And then the other remaining percent is public. So we have now developed throughout this entire industry the capacity to produce those chargers. If you look at some of the DOE data and the loans they've given for charging manufacturing companies relocating in the United States, it's simply outstanding numbers. Blink has just brought online a new facility in Maryland that will soon to be announced, but ups our capacity on L2 exclusively in the U.S. up to 50,000 uh, units per year. And we're going to see that even double over the next three and four years. So we're going to meet the challenge of capacity. But to the other point, we're also simultaneously doubling down on quality. 
there's no question that some of the legacy chargers that were put out over the last 10 to 15 years need to be relooked at, some need to be ripped out, and the quality needs to improve. But really, we need to focus on breaking this assumption that you have to go to a gas station to fuel. You don't. You go home to fuel. And the reliability on those chargers is really, really good. Joel, what is the next step that you would like to see from the federal government in terms of prioritizing the network and make sure, making sure that there is more access for drivers? Right. Uh, I think I would say two things. Uh, number one is uh, the consumer experience. So not just focusing on building out the network, uh, but that the consumer experience is really positive. So um, when you look at, let's say, the gas station experience, not that, not that we're big advocates of, of buying gasoline, but the gas station experience, uh, when, when a consumer goes there, it's a pretty reliable, consistent experience. Uh, the pumps always work. They always take a credit card. The, the price is posted. Um, it's, it's well lit. It's covered. Uh, it's a pretty positive experience. Um, I'd like to see the charging experience be at least that good when you go to a public charging uh, station. Uh, so that's number one, is that the consumer experience is is positive and easy for EV drivers. Uh, and then second, I think we need to really focus on the challenge for people who live in apartments. So Brendan's absolutely right. The, the bulk of people charge at home and the home charging experience is pretty good and pretty easy. Um, I charge in my own driveway and it's, it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, but if you live in an apartment, it's not. And so I, I think there needs to be more energy put into um, addressing the issue for apartment dwellers. And it's it's not a simple problem. It's probably the single most challenging problem we have in the EV space. And it's going to be a mixture of uh, doing retrofits on older buildings, uh, getting building codes in place for construction of newer buildings, uh, creating more public charging that's close to where people live, um, and um, some, some DC fast charging, and then also charging at work. A lot of times for people who can't charge at home, charging at work can be a great option as well. So there's there's kind of a whole range of solutions, but but definitely for the, you know, roughly half of Americans who live in apartments, uh, charging is is more challenging than for people who live in a single family house. You know, I just want to end on a prediction here from, from both of you. And, and Joel, I'll go to you first since you ended on the thought there. Um, when do you believe that we could potentially start to scratch the surface of not just widespread EV adoption, but really see this in, in critical mask uh, critical mass, excuse me, among the American public? Well, I would say that it's happening now and it's happening really rapidly. Um, it's going to be in different uh, places at different times. So, for example, in uh, larger urban areas, there's a lot of EVs out there and it's growing very rapidly. Uh, in rural areas, it's harder because Historically, the the EV the cars that people want to drive that have not been electric up until now, but that's changing um, very quickly as we're getting more pickups and larger EVs out there. So I would say that it depends where you live, but uh, in larger areas, sure. it's it's happening right now very quickly. And, and Brendan, very quickly, the same question to you with with this added note of I mean, one of the other major players in this charge point just had to raise $232 million in order to support their path to profitability. H how much more liquidity needs to be injected into companies as well that are bringing this to life in order to be profitable in this endeavor? So, Jan, on the, the, first, the last question there you asked, there's no question that we need to create sustainable business models. And at Blink, we're working towards that right now. We have a a, a bit of positive number we put out there by December 2024. So we have to create sustainable companies and Blink is working to that. Others in the industry are working on that. But you know, you do need that investment dollar today, those capital dollars to make the future of tomorrow come true. But you know, to the other uh, question, we're seeing the growth, right? It's just now we have to do that growth at a profitable level. We have to focus on business fundamentals and make sure we're making the right type of investments to create sustainable charging infrastructure from uh, the U.S. and in the Europe. But the numbers are very positive. Uh, as we referenced earlier in this call, with 22% plus in growing sales in California, which is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, that's a strong indicator of where it's going. Now, Blink has the advantage. We have three business units in Europe. And we're already much higher than that at the penetration rate in some of the companies we operate. So we look at Europe and we have some predictability. 
uh, on what's going to happen in the U.S., especially in the major metros, as was just referenced. So that's where the growth, but the trickle down effect is starting to happen. And then look towards the OEMs. And, you know, when I started this, we were selling Nissan Leafs uh, and that was a subcompact car. Now we've got a car and a vehicle for every segment with a multiplicity of offerings with ranges up to four and, and 450 miles. We've taken range anxiety out by building new charging infrastructures, and we're going to continue to do that. So we say the, uh, the future is very, very bright. Uh, we need investments, uh, but we also need yeah. to work on the fundamentals of sustainability and profitability for all the companies, Blink included. All right, gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO and President, and Joel Levin, who is the Plug in America Executive Director, joining us here. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks.
Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. Here is your morning rundown. First, data out this morning shows headline inflation coming in a touch hotter than expected in September, signaling pricing pressures remain stubborn. At least the Fed's, uh, and at the Fed's last meeting, rather, officials agreed that the central bank policy should remain restrictive for some time, but there's plenty more metrics to come before the data-dependent Fed's November meeting. An earnings season taking off. Delta delivering record third quarter revenue thanks to robust consumer demand. The airline's report echoing Wall Street expectations that this third quarter earnings season will be positive. And a major escalation in the UAW strike. Auto workers walked off the job Wednesday evening at Ford's Kentucky truck plant, the company's largest in terms of revenue and employment. Ford says the new strike puts a dozen other operations at risk, with the UAW calling it a new phrase in their efforts to secure a fair contract. Let's get to today's morning driver. The conundrum overpricing pressures that continues. Inflation still proving stubborn, even if it's on something of a downtrend. The headline number coming in slightly above expectations as 3.7% on the year and four tenths of a percent on the month. But so called sticky core number falling in line. And perhaps that's what's giving investors something to cheer about this morning. The data dependent Fed will be keeping a close eye on the reading, of course. Now, on Wednesday, minutes showed a majority of FOM. MC officials thinking one more interest rate would likely be appropriate in the future. The latest Fed speak painting a mixed picture on the central bank's next policy decision. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic and Boston Fed President Susan Collins both expected to speak later today, and that could give investors more insight over the Fed's trajectory on rate hikes and whether or not it is likely we will see another rate hike before the end of the year. And Brad, just breaking down this number a little bit and also the reaction that we've seen in the markets, because initially it took me by a bit of a surprise yeah. because that headline number did come in a bit hotter than expected. But yet we still look, at least for now, futures holding on to gains. Now, we shouldn't make too much of the movement that we're seeing so early because we know a lot of traders obviously trade on those numbers when they initially break. So we'll see how this all plays out today when the street has a little bit more time to digest this report. But the market reaction relatively muted. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that core came in in line with expectations, but also it's on the heels of what we saw yesterday from producer prices and the fact that it reconfirmed some some of the pricing pressures or inflationary pressures that we saw yesterday yeah. and exactly what this means then for Fed policy going forward and the fact that this inflation fight is far from over. And that's the big question. What does this mean for Fed, Fed policy going forward here? And particularly if we look at the CME Fed Watch tool and where the movements continue to take us as of right now, if you were to think back to the beginning of this month, there was at least a possibility at 20 percent chance that we could see some sort of hiking action from the Fed at this November meeting. However, if you look at the probability at this point in time, after today's CPI print, after yesterday's PPI, plus the Fed meeting minutes that came out yesterday afternoon, that probability of a pause right now is sitting at roughly 95 percent, according to the CME Fed Watch tool. So thinking about how this also is where the markets may be paying close attention to, because if you take that probability for a hike off the table now, then it puts us squarely into the conversation of, OK, could we in this higher for longer period be at a longer pause than expected before we see the next card shown by the Fed here? Yeah, Brad, and taking a look at where we are seeing some of this pressure when it comes to pricing pressure to the upside here, housing and gasoline both adding to September's pricing pressures. On the flip side, prices for clothing and also used cars that actually declined last month. So certainly uh, trends that you should keep in mind when we're trying to figure out exactly where we are in this fight against inflation. So yes, we are seeing some improvement, but when you take a look at the headline number and even the core number, still very far from the Fed's 2% target, mm -hmm. a target they have that they have not shown any signs of budging from anytime soon. Fed Chair Jerome Powell reiterating that 2% inflation target time and time again. So yes, some improvement in some areas, but still not enough for the Fed in terms in terms of what they want to see going forward with inflationary pressures. Yeah, some of the key indexes here within this too. Indexes which increased in September include rent, owner's equivalent rent, which is what the Fed pays close attention to as well, lodging away from home. So people still out there traveling, booking either at Airbnb or perhaps at one of the hotels for uh, 
uh, accommodations and cleaning process that you don't have to do yourself. Anyway, I digress. Personal care, new vehicles, all of those still intertwined within some of the indexes that did increase over the month here. We're also going to break down September's CPI report further. Our very own Akiko Fujita going to be speaking to Jared Bernstein, U.S. Council of Economic Advisors Chair. That's going to be coming your way at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. But first, it's the year of Taylor Swift. I, along with Brad and Alexandra Canal, we're going to be taking a deep dive into how Taylor Swift has played a key role in the economy's growth this year. That all starts 10 a.m. Eastern Time. You won't want to miss it. we got to throw in Taylor Time out. there at the top. When they said it was the TaylorMade Economy show that we were talking about, I thought we were talking about golf. You no? wish. You I wish. wish. Maybe I one wish. day. Okay. Come on, you got to be excited about Swift. I'm just going to throw away my golf notes, I guess. You that's, know, that's I think you have. You could become a Swiftie. I got, I got, in the I got, some, I got some Swift notes. Know. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it will be. Everyone tune into that at 10 a.m. In a midweek surprise, United Auto Workers Union President Sean Fain announced that the strikes would expand once again, this time hitting Ford's biggest plant. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Pros Subramanian to give us the details. Pros, what do we know right now? Hey, Brad, yeah, the 20, on the 27th day of the strikes yesterday, a major surprise, the UAW calling that surprise stand-up strike at Ford's Kentucky truck plant. This is a massive move as this plant builds the F-250 through the F-550 super, truck, uh, super duty trucks, Ford Expedition, Lincoln Navigator. So now it doesn't touch the F-150, but Ford says the plant is responsible for $25 billion in revenue annually. So that's, that's a big deal there, a big raising the stakes. And, you know, so it sort of went down last night when uh, CNBC reported that the UAW wanted a new offer by 5 p.m. with a meeting request at 5.30. Uh, sources said the meeting lasted only 10 minutes before UAW President Sean Fain said that Ford had, quote, lost Kentucky truck. Uh, the union further said that the strike was called for after Ford refused to make further movement in bargaining, unquote. Uh, it kind of marks a new phase here, as I mentioned. And Ford's response came quickly, saying that the move was, quote, grossly irresponsible but not, surpri not surprising, and that the move carries serious consequences for our workforce, suppliers, dealers and commercial customers. So really big amping up of the UAW stand-up strike strategy here and, and Ford kind of feeling the pinch uh, at their big Kentucky truck plant. Sorry, yeah, Kentucky, yes, that is correct. <laughs> a lot going on. I know, Pras. Well, it's hard to keep, you have a lot to keep track of right now <laughs> with, the, with the UAW striking the three largest uh, automakers and then obviously expanding here by the week, it seems like. Pras, what do you think this tells us just about the timing potentially of a deal? Because there has been some chatter on the street this morning that potentially this could be a positive sign that we might be closer to reaching some sort of agreement in the next couple of weeks. In a lot of analysts talking about how do we get to end game quickly? Uh, would it be yeah. the automakers locking out all the auto work, auto workers, or would it be the opposite with the would this would be the union saying, you know what, we're going to hit the most profitable plants and force the two sides to come together, to kind of reach an agreement. So I think I think you're absolutely right. I think this is kind of reaching that end game where the most pain is being felt, not just by the automakers, but also by the auto workers. The more workers that are on strike, uh, the less money they get. It drains the reserve fund that UAW has for those striking workers. So I think it's sort of we're coming to a head here, possibly. You know, at some time the next month we'll see but um i think it's just the rancor of this has sort of increased beyond what i thought a few months ago what would happen this is kind of getting a, becoming a nasty fight and you know if you're the automakers you want to get that truck plant back online but how much is it going to cost you from a further contract point of view is it going to make you so uncompetitive versus the non-union uh, automakers that it's it's all it's already lost to begin with so we'll see what how that calculus works but yeah i think you're right i think this end game is going to come sooner rather than later because of the fact that there's so much like pain happening we'll see what happens with, with uh gm and Stellantis, but it could also affect them too down the line you know process is there anything that we can extrapolate from gm being able to reach a deal in canada and kind of put that towards some of the discussions that are continuing to play out right here in the U.S. I don't think Canada is the big factor here. Canada is a different system. They have national health care. So sort of stuff like benefits is a different story. But I think the big thing, Brad, was mm -hmm. when GM agreed to add the battery plants to the master agreements for the UAW. So basically what they're saying is that all these joint venture battery plants will now come under UAW purview. They can, have, they can unionize their Ford and Slantis haven't agreed to that. I think that's what that's what the UAW wants. They want Ford and, and Slantis to kind of agree to that, and then they would sort of maybe pull, pull back. But that's the big sticking point right now is what's going to happen with those future EV and battery plants. All right, Prost, thanks so much for breaking all of that down for us.
We want to get to one of the big movers this morning, and that is Delta shares on the move after the company reported its third quarter earnings. Now, the airline saw profits surge as strong travel demand continued throughout the summer, looking at gains of just about 3% in the pre-market. CEO Ed Bastian saying this morning that he expects the same trends to continue in the current quarter. Looking at the top line numbers for Q3, Delta's revenue coming in at $14.5 billion. That was in line with expectations. Adjusted earnings was a beat with $2.03 per share. Joining us now for these results, we want to bring in George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst. George, it's great to see you there. So let's start with the numbers that we got out this morning. They topped estimates, but Delta did trim its profit outlook for the year. What's your first take on the numbers and some of the commentary that we're getting in this release? Yeah, so thanks for having me. I, I, the first take, I guess, is... Um, you know, the expense expenses are largely set. That they recently did, did these pilot deals and labor deals that have increased their expenses. Fuel is going to be what it's going to be, and so I think the big variable uh, as we go into the back part of the year is going to be revenue. It's going to be fares, right? And so w- when we look at three uh, Q earnings, it's a lot of what we expected. Although there's, you know, there's a slowdown in uh, U.S. domestic. Uh, I, I shouldn't say slowdown. There's a a diminution in fares yields, they're down 5% in U.S. domestic. So that probably concerns us the most going forward because it feels like the U.S. consumer could be running out of gas. It's going to be their biggest market, right? The consumer is squeezed by higher interest rates, higher inflation. So we have to see how that domestic demand holds up. Uh, Transatlantic was really strong. Fares were up. Yields, you know, we, we measure it in yields, up sort of 9% across the Atlantic. We knew that it was a strong summer season. Uh, it was a bounce back, you know, after pandemic had closed international markets um, for, for a number of years. Not sure you get that kind of bounce back next summer. Even as we go into 4Q and 1Q, I'm not sure if business is ready to support that level of yields across the Atlantic. So, again, I think those are the big variables at Delta we're, we're going to watch pretty closely. We're concerned a little bit. There's a lot of leisure in here uh, and corporate won't be able to support these kind of yields going forward. So so what you're describing, George, then, is the expectation of normalization in some of the travel patterns then. So what does that spell out for some of the profit that we've seen grow over at Delta and, and for this company that was the first U.S. airline to get back towards profitability after the pandemic and, and after trying to bring capacity back online? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be hard to maintain these high levels of profits uh, because, as you said, as we normalize, uh, as demand normalizes, we would expect that fares would have to come down to continue to feel, fill airplanes as the consumer just doesn't pay whatever it takes to go somewhere. Um, and, yeah, so we're, we're, we're watching that pretty closely. And, you know, again, we've got a consumer that's more squeezed than they have been uh, a- after the pandemic, right? Interest rates are higher than they were even during the pandemic to the extent the consumer has debt that's costing them more. And then we've got inflation, that's, you know, essentially higher fuel prices, all uh, higher food prices, all these other things that are in the economy that are squeezing that a consumer, again, higher than they saw during the pandemic. So as this normalization, you know, uh, happens, uh, we don't think fares can stay this high because I, we just don't see this, again, pay at all to, to go on vacation trend. George, how big of a decline are you expecting to see in fares? Uh, I mean, so 5% actually surprised me a bit for uh, domestic mm-hmm. in uh, in 3Q. Uh, I would expect you could continue to see that kind of trend uh, in 4Q and 1Q, you know, so that's going to, again, that's going to take a pretty big bite out of out of revenue. The Sky Miles program was one area that customers were, in some cases, infuriated by over the quarter. Was there any evidence yeah. that that was a deterrent for purchases, for travel plans that were perhaps enacted, but even as we think towards some of the future bookings that the company is talking about? Yeah, you know, we, we, I can't tell that yet from the financial statements. But I do think it was telling that they reversed some of those changes and Bastion came out and talked to, you know, sort of directly about that. That's a really important mm-hmm. program. $1.7 billion in remuneration during this quarter from American Express. 
So uh, it seems like they may have went too far and something, again, we'll have to watch. George, when we talk about one of the other challenges here for Delta and many of the airlines, the geo, the uh, war going on right now between Israel and Hamas, the fact that it could widen in the Middle East, what that looks like for the airlines. How big of a impact do you see this being, not only for Delta, but also for the other larger U.S. carriers that have suspended flights to Israel as well? So right now, not a lot. That's a small portion mm -hmm. of their businesses going into Israel, Middle East. If it widens, it could become a lot more of an issue. And then I think the fuel fuel price is something we're watching as well, right? If, if uh, problems in the Middle East uh, widen, I think you'll see fuel prices and oil prices gap out, and that's going to be a problem too. All right, George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst, uh, Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst. George, go ahead and get in the office, man. Uh, we don't <laughs> want to hold you outside for too much longer. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Cheers. All right. See you soon. All right. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We might be on Cornelia Street right now, but Taylor Swift is definitely not heartbroken. From a $5 billion tour to a new movie on the big screen, Taylor Swift is all anyone can talk about. And her superstardom is expanding beyond the Billboard charts and having an unheard impact on the U.S. economy. From increasing viewership for the NFL to getting blamed for inflation, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style. And we have all the details for you right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got just outside of 10 minutes until the opening bell. Let's take a look to see what stocks are doing pre-market here. For that, we've got Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery standing about eh, 10 paces to our left here. Jared. Yep, 10 <laughs> paces to my right. Very astute there. Appreciate it. Uh, the markets are not really reacting that greatly to the CPI report this morning. As you can see here on the Wi-Fi Interactive, NASDAQ, uh, this is a four-day look. This is what's happened this week. And you can see took a bit of a drop, but still kind of hovering around the break-even line. Uh, over this time period, you can take a look at the S&P 500. That also took a little bit of a dive, came back, and then sold off some more. But we are talking about very small amounts here. These are by no means outsized reactions. And that CPI report, the headline number, which I've been watching carefully, that stood pat at 3.7%. Uh, that is off the lows a few months ago of 3.0%, but it did not accelerate uh, again this month as it did the prior two. Now, here we have our sector action. 
Energy in the forefront, that is up 1% in the pre-market. Um, if we take a look at the three-day price action for this week, you can see that's up 2.1% as of the close yesterday. Going to add to, add to some gains this morning. We'll see if we can hold on to those into the close. Utilities having a tough time this week and also taking another hit today. Uh, this morning down about four-tenths of a percent. I'm going to put the one-day price action back on. And uh, just mentioning or rounding out the top line, we got materials industrials, healthcare, communica communication services, and staples. So another risk on day. And think about everything the market has shrugged off recently. We had a kind of hot CPI report today. We had that incursion in Gaza earlier in the week and over the weekend. Last Friday, we had that non-farm payroll reports. The headline number really spooked the markets initially, but then the markets came roaring back um, into the end of the day. So the market has been quite resilient recently. Here is our leaders and sentiment indicators. Uh, look like uh, solar is getting a little love this morning, followed by Korean stocks, uh, some regional banks, transportation, crypto, but not any big movers there. Want to check what's happening in the oil patch. Yesterday was a big day for Exxon, announcement of that Pioneer deal finally. Uh, that took a hit of 3.5%. So did Chevron, about 3%. Both of those back, bouncing back in the pre-market here. And just rounding out the analysis with a look at the futures, it looks like crude oil is the uh, number one uh, mover here. That's actually cocoa futures, but we can take a look at crude. There we go, up 1.65%. Off of the highs we saw earlier uh, in the month and also late last month, but uh, bouncing back a little bit from the price action, the negative price action over the last couple of days, guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Stick with us here. We're just about uh, nine minutes until the opening bell. We'll check in back with you then. All right, let, in the meantime, let's take a look at some of the movers out this morning. A lot of this on the back of earnings. Walgreens shares moving to the upside up nearly 3% in the pre-market. The company offering soft profit guidance, also missing fiscal fourth quarter Profit expectations of results now mean that they've underperformed Wall Street's adjusted earnings expectations for two quarters in a row. Now, that has not happened in some time for Walgreens. Walgreens also saying that it expects adjusted earnings per share of $3.20 to $3.50 in the coming fiscal year. That was lower than what the street had anticipated. Now, Brad, this is a stock that has been under pressure now for some time. We talk about the turnaround. We talk about what needs to happen in order to regain some of the momentum that's been lost when you take a look at the fact that COVID vaccines and also just the fact that people are not buying tests nearly at the rate that they had been over the last three years, that yeah. has certainly weighed on Walgreens' results here over the most recent quarters. They have a new CEO at the helm, Tim Wentworth. Now, I think the big question here for investors, for analysts, is what is going to be his top priority going forward and also what he plans to do in terms of the cost reductions and what needs to happen for Walgreens to regain some of that momentum and also just expand parts of their business, which have been lagging just a bit when you take into account some of the issues that we've seen and the slow ramp up that we've seen in their health unit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm looking across some of the segments here and investors who are thinking about what has already taken place in terms of the announcement for changes at the top here, not just for a new CEO, but there's also still question marks around who could be that next CFO at Walgreens as well to really kind of pair with the new appointment to CEO here. But for two of the segments that investors keep a close eye on here moving forward here, pharmacy comp sales and retail comp sales. Pharmacy comp sales in this most recent quarter up by about 9.9%. Retail comp sales up by about 11.7% here. And then additionally here, you think about what the foot traffic looks like. Strong retail comp sales growth of 11.7% in the fourth quarter with growth across all categories is what they're talking about there. But the store basket size, that's only up by about 5% versus the prior year here. So all in, I, I think even if they're talking about the consecutive growth for Boots, for Walgreens specifically, it's going to be how do you kind of pair that in-store environment, that in-store experience with some of the other healthcare offerings that they're trying to in tandem for all of the companies in this PBM space, make sure that they've got kind of an all-inclusive, uh, all-serving, one-stop shop type of ecosystem that they're powering. And, and those are some of the investments that I look forward to hearing more about from this new executive team once they get boots to the ground, no pun intended there, but, you know, fully, full speed ahead here. Yeah, certainly that's going to be one of the question points or focal points, I should say, of the street, just in terms of what that, how big of a boost and what needs to happen in order to uh, regain some momentum. Also just cost cutting measures. Yes. I think that's going to yeah. be a topic on this call. They're going to want to hear a little bit more in this release. CEO uh, Ginger Graham saying that they do anticipate seeing the impact 
of the cost cuts of a billion dollars and also lowering CapEx expenditures by 600 million. They expect to see the impact of those actions in fiscal 2024 beginning in the second quarter. So I think any more details on that and of course what that looks like under the new CEO yeah. is going to be a big question here for analysts. We, we heard from Liz Young saying, uh, from, Liz Young from SoFi joined us earlier this week, said the theme of this earnings quarter might be cost discipline. Yeah. Those are two of the words that are already said here in this Walgreens Boots Alliance earnings announcement, and we're basically on day one. Of she the knows what she's talking about. She you got to listen to her. She does. All right, guys, Microsoft shares, ticker symbol MSFT. Light it up. There it is. It's down. Nine tenths, eight tenths of a percent here pre-market. The IRS saying the tech company owes nearly $29 billion in taxes, back taxes. Tech giant disagrees, though saying they have already paid up to $10 billion in taxes. And it's not reflected in the adjustments and plans to dispute. The IRS has had a long-running investigation into how Microsoft allocated its profits among countries and locations between 2004 and 2013. Now, for a lot of where those profits, revenues were recognized, allocated for a lot of big tech companies, there was a renewed focus on this back in 2017, 2018, 2017, around the uh, Tax Cuts um, Act under the Trump administration because of the repatriation that many of those tech companies would have to do. Uh, and the IRS, I think, for years has been trying to wrap their own hands uh, and minds around exactly where some of those taxes still have yet to make their way back to the U.S. for what was uh, repatriated or what should have been paid um, even in those prior practices as well. Yeah, and just again, look at the street's reaction to this. Not too big, as you can see, shares off just about nine-tenths of a percent, but Bank of America out saying that they, do, that they do not expect a material impact on this. When you take a look at fiscal year 2024, also fiscal year 2025, they also expect, obviously, like uh, Microsoft has said in their blog post, that they do intend to dispute and also plan to appeal uh, this case, and it's unlikely to be, to be resolved in the next 12 months. Analysts are going to be wanting to hear a little bit more about this on the upcoming earnings call that we're going to be getting from Microsoft in just a few weeks from now. But at least for now, there's not too much concern about what this could mean for Microsoft in the short term. All right, Domino stock, a touch lower this morning. Revenue missed expectations. The company also saying that it expects 2023 global net store growth to be a bit stale. You're looking at losses oh. of just about three-tenths of a percent. Now, estimating it'll hit the low end of their 5 to 7% target in the next two to three years. For more on this, we want to bring Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma. Brooke, what do you make of these results? Good morning, Shauna. Well, the call is still going on and the company really weighing in on this new promotion that they have about emergency pizza, or basically it's a big loyalty play that comes as they continue to try to drive sales here in the U.S. We did see that top line miss on revenue due to that weaker domestic franchise seam source sales as we continue to try to move forward past the pandemic. In addition to that, they also saw a hit on supply chain revenue due to a decrease in the company's market basket, basket price the stores and lower order volumes during that third quarter. Now, here in the U.S., price increases across the U.S. system were up 3.2 percent, so those higher prices perhaps hitting the company as well. But they are lapping that uh, mix and match pricing change that they introduced back in October 22, 2022, and so perhaps some insight there. But that net unit growth there, really something that Wall Street is keeping a closer Ion, they lowered their outlook for 2023's predicted softer unit growth. They did note, though, that domestic franchisees are on track for uh, to generate $155,000 per store in cash flow this year. That is higher than last year. And the company really trying to remain bullish despite these results on the call. Executives saying that headwinds on openings have subsided. They also said that staffing is back to 2019 levels, something that the restaurant and fast food industry continues to try to push through. They said that the build cost that was up 20% since 2019 is now coming in at a similar level, but that is now flattening. And so lots of momentum building into the back half of the year, but Domino's Pizza is still trying to push through some headwinds here. Okay, so Brooke, one of the headwinds that several companies like McDonald's, Pepsi, uh, even Domino's have to try and push through and more, They've mentioned Ozempic and other appetite suppressing drugs and how that might hurt their bottom line. Did Domino's have to say anything about that? I mean, if, you, if you've 
been on Ozempic, I, I guess not even some garlic sauce to go with your pizza could entice you to have some. Right. Well, interestingly enough, Brad, the call is still happening and no word yet on any impact of weight loss drugs, of Ozempic, like we've heard from so many other companies about perhaps a slight impact that weight loss drugs will have on their sales. You know, many on the street expecting a one to three percent, uh, you know, a rather one to three percent of the U.S. population only takes these drugs. That's only the impact that it will have. But once again, Domino's, no word yet on if that will play a part in the back half of the year, or if that is something that they're keeping their eye on, but many analysts curious. But one thing that Domino's Pizza did weigh on that they're really hoping boost sales in the back half of the year is Uber Eats partnership. They're saying that right now, this is really a handshake between two major companies. Uh, this uh, integration into the Uber Eats platform that many uh, analysts were surprised by is proceeding as planned. They said they'll achieve their goal of providing delivery orders to all U.S. source by the end of the year. They went on to say that this will provide a measurable impact into the first quarter of 2023, and they expect it to drive incremental delivery volume from new customers. And one thing that is really interesting here is the company, uh, rather the CEO, said on the call that for the best value, for the best prices, you have to go to dominospizza.com. This Uber Eats uh, customer is going to be an entirely new customer. But this, once again, it is going to proceed as planned. They plan to move to new markets in the next few weeks, including Houston, Texas, Miami, Detroit, and Seattle in both corporate and franchise source. But he said this is really a pilot. They're not doing any marketing around it, but they do expect that this will drive volume, this will bring in new customers, and they are going to get a premium price from this partnership with Uber Eats. But I'll stay tuned and I'll keep a lookout to see if you mention anything on those weight loss drugs. All right, Brooks, we appreciate, appreciate that. Brooke DeBama, Yahoo Finance, uh, food reporter, right? Food reporter, that's fair to say. All right, Brooke, thanks. Let's get to the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the markets here in reaction to that CPI print that we got this morning. Jared, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the NASDAQ 100 heat map here, and we can see a mixed board, but a decent amount of green. And let me just show you what's happened. This is the fourth day of the week, so let's uh, chart the price action here. And we can see Amazon up 3.7%, 3, 3 Meta up 3.9%. A lot of these issues up more than two, like NVIDIA, Alphabet, uh, just pointing to some, to some surprising strength in the market. Um, if you'd uh, come here Monday morning, we, there was a somewhat uh, somber tone here. This is, again, the sector action over the last four Four days, utilities and real estate, those two defensive and interest rate sectors, uh, those have bounced back. I think on the back of declining yields, uh, those decline, those rising yields actually caused utilities here to fall out of bed a couple weeks ago. And now the uh, decline is allowing a little bit of headroom, a little bit of breathing room there. But everything in the green this week, uh, energies, industrials, communication services and tech rounding out the top row there. So I'm going to put this back on an intraday view. And let's take a look at some of our leaders here to see what's moving. Uh, the, the PSCE, that takes care of some of the smaller oil stocks. That is up 1.3 percent leading the way. But then we have New York Fang, uh, those mega cap uh, stocks behind that. We also have value outperforming to the downside home builders. That's XHB um, is taking it on the chin. This is over the last three months. We know that rising mortgage rates. Um, we've seen a really rapid decrease in the amount of new mortgage applications, probably weighing on that sector. Uh, Want to take a look at energy so we can get a look at a green board. Uh, it's been green most of the week here. Crude oil bouncing back off of some of the lows of the week. Exxon Mobil up half a percent, uh, coming off of a steep loss, 3% yesterday. Chevron bouncing back as well. ConocoPhillips, BP each up more than 1%. And just taking a look at the banks ahead of tomorrow's earnings, for J.P. Morgan, we're seeing more red than green. Um, don't want to read too much into this, uh, but here's Barclays. Barclays down 3.5% over the last uh, three months, down 6 and two-thirds of a percent. Guys. Thanks so much, Jared. Appreciate that update here. Going to keep a close eye on those banks, especially going into tomorrow. Well, fire up the clog, though. Birkenstock shares, they're on the move here today, down by about three-tenths of a percent. The company stumbled out of the gate here in its market debut yesterday, ending the day nearly 12% below its 
IPO price. Bad news for the over 200-year-old shoemaker. It's the worst debut by a company worth over $1 billion in nearly two years. This is just the latest IPO to underwhelm, of course, Arm, Instacart, and Clavio. Those shares have mostly fallen since their initial listings. Taking a look at shares here today, they're sitting at about $40. Of course, that peg to kind of remind our viewers out there, $46 is where this company had priced at, where they were looking to uh, make sure that they saw a first day pop off of, but ultimately did not here. Um, but hey, good news. They're still very comfortable out there, just in case you want to buy a pair of $150 clogs. They're comfortable. But this really makes you question some of these valuations of these companies, right? When you well, take yes. into account the reception or the lack thereof that Birkenstock got in its first day of trading. And now this is a little bit different than what we saw from Instacart and what we saw from Arm and what we saw from Clavio because we did see some excitement on those first days of trading for those companies. Birkenstock clearly fell flat a little bit. And I think this also begs the question about what this tells us about demand for IPOs and when we're going to see a return of activity because there was lots of focus on whether or not this would be with Birkenstock along with Clavio, along with Instacart and Arm, whether or not this was going to spark some more activity in the current quarter, in the fourth quarter, and then looking ahead to 2024. But I think this makes you question whether or not we're going to be, we're going to see a return of the deal making activity that maybe we had hopefully or had hoped for going back just about a month ago. Here's the problem here. We can sit but here. They're too and, expensive. Uh, they're too expensive. We could sit here and look at this beautiful B-roll of a longitudinal uh, arch grip or, or a toe grip or anything, or the arch support, excuse me. Don't want to get that wrong, or the footbed edge. All of these different parts of the shoe. Look, at the end of the day, for a tenth of the price in a trade-down environment for the consumer, you could get at Walmart for $13 a knockoff pair of Birkenstocks. You can get your Birkenstocks and feel real good out there, feel just fine. They'll last you probably for one summer. But at the end of the day, for a consumer that's trying to figure out exactly where those discretionary dollars are going, that spells problems for Birkenstocks and being able to sell them at this price and perhaps puts pressure on margins that now the street is going to come to expect quarter after quarter after quarter. Well, they might look similar, but the quality is not the same. The quality is not the same, but for $13, $16, I have no problem yeah, with them not lasting. 10 pairs of those, and then you're paying the same that you'd be for one pair of Birkenstock. Great, right, not a bad point. All right, we're going to leave that there. We keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back.
Shares of Walgreens are on the move following the company's latest earnings results. Now, Walgreens missed the mark for two straight quarters. Losses significantly lower over COVID-19 vaccines and also testing volumes. The last time the company posted a consecutive earnings miss was nearly a decade ago. Walgreens looking to regain some footing with his leadership shakeup. Veteran healthcare executive Tim Wentworth will take the helm beginning October 23rd, nearly two months after Roz Brewer stepped down from the position. And we want to bring in Brian Tankulet. He's Jeffrey's health care services analyst. Brian, it's great to see you here. So just taking a look at these numbers that we're getting here from Walgreens, adjusted EPS forecast missing the street's expectations. Also, it's adjusted profit for the most recent quarter coming up a bit short. Yet we're seeing the stock in positive territory. What's going on here? Hey, Shauna, good morning and thanks for having me. So yeah, just to answer your question, I think what you're seeing here is that management announced this morning that they're looking at a billion dollar cost reduction effort um, that they're implementing here in the next few months. And then they're also reducing their CapEx budget for 2024. And as you said, you know, Tim Wentworth, a very seasoned healthcare executive is expected to join the company, company in a few weeks here. So I think there's a little bit of excitement around that. But really, I think it's the fact that you know they are doing the right moves to drive cost savings and improve profitability in some of their you know, underperforming segments, specifically the Walgreens Health uh, business that they uh, you know, saw $300 million of losses in, in fiscal 23. Does that cost discipline, as they put it in their presentation, does that equate to structural changes that we should expect to come forward at Walgreens? Hey, Brad, yeah, I think a lot of that will come from, first, it's, it's headcount reduction at the head office level. I think that's, that's one that's one thing they're looking at. They're looking at some structural changes, such as reducing store hours, especially in markets where it doesn't make sense to be open, you know, whether it's 24-hour stores or stores that are open past 9 o'clock, right? And I think you're going to see some situations where the, the pharmacy side of the business or of the store will be open fewer hours to make it more profitable. So, you're going to see some changes like that uh, being rolled out here over the next few months. Brian, what do you think the top priority should be or needs to be for Tim Wentworth when he takes the helm? So I, I think the, the thing that's changing with Walgreens is that they're making a big push into healthcare, right? So I think Tim, being the healthcare executive that he is, you know, very seasoned, uh, will have to look at putting all these assets that they've bought over the last few years that are healthcare related and coming up with a good synergistic offering that actually um, generates profitability. You know, so for example, Village MD and City MD, which they bought um, last year, as a business has been losing a lot of money. So I think that turning that segment around is important, but also I think having a, a solid healthcare strategy going forward is important for Walgreens to be viable as a company. You know, when you look at CVS with their Aetna business and their PBM, I think Walgreens feels the need to have a similar, you know, healthcare focused um, strategy. And I think Tim will have his hands full trying to put all these things together. When you think about the, the different kind of services that, that those pharmacies within Walgreens provide, and, and for where Walgreens and CVS and some of the other largest PBM players have been able to maintain market share, it's it's a kind of market share guarantee when you're the company that's working with some of these larger entities that have the IP, that have the patents, but some of those patents are starting to roll off. So how does a patent roll off also impact a company like a Walgreens? That's a good question, Brad. So as we think about the drug world, right, I mean, today, you know, roughly 90% of all prescriptions filled are generic already. Um, now, the remaining 10%, though, a lot of those are, what are biologics or what we call specialty drugs, and they still represent about 50% of overall drug spend. And I think that's one area where Walgreens does not have a good presence or as significant of a presence as, say, you know, United Health and Optum or CVS uh, with their Caremark specialty pharmacy business. So I think it's an area where we're seeing a lot of growth that Walgreens needs to have hmm. a footprint in at some point. Uh, but also, like, uh, you know, to, to your question about the PBM, I think some of the challenges we've seen over the last few years is that the PBMs have been putting pressure on pricing for these retail pharmacies where the view has become that retail pharmacy is a commodity at this point, right? So I think having the healthcare assets behind them and having, you know, some of the clinics inside the pharmacy locations will give Walgreens hopefully some leverage to push back, you know, down the road against some of these 
gross margin and pricing pressures from the PBMs. What, what type of risk factor do you assess to just the convenience factor of a pill pack even or some of the other delivery services that have emerged where PBMs would typically rely on people to come get their prescriptions filled and come in person? No, it's, it's a good question. So if you think about, you know, their pill pack has been around, you know, obviously Amazon bought them a few years back. You know, Mark Cuban's uh, discount plus uh, strategies out there as well. So there are a lot of these emerging disruptors in the pharmacy space. Now, what we're seeing, though, is that as the as most of the patients, right, that are using a, a lot of drugs, and we think about the demographic changes with the senior population growing, um, seniors love to go to their pharmacy. I mean, they love the relationship or the, the in-person interaction with the pharmacist. So that's actually hard to disrupt. So while there are models out there that are aimed at reducing costs, I think that the pharmacy exists for a reason and that a lot of consumers would want to keep that relationship. And pharmacists are very trusted healthcare practic practitioners uh, in the market, probably more so than um, more so than physicians in some cases. So I think that you know the the pharmacy business will survive. I think the pharmacy business will need to exist, um, and and consumers will want to continue going there. It's just a matter of finding the right model where the pricing is right, the margins are sustainable, and and returns to investors are adequate. Brian Tankerlet, who is the Jeffrey Healthcare Services Analyst. Brian, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Shana. Yeah, definitely. Talk soon. Well, switching gears here in a big way. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. One lucky ticket holder in California holds the $1.76 billion Powerball jackpot ticket on Wednesday night that was selected. While Powerball tickets are $2 per play, the lottery says the odds of winning this prize was 1 in 292.2 million. Lottery rules around claiming prizes differentiate per state, with some allowing the winner to remain anonymous. But not this time around. California law mandates the lucky player must reveal their name. All right. Who are you? Tell us. Or jealous. Yeah. But you want to be you friends. Know I want to bring up something because yesterday when we were talking about this, you said you thought Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. Indiana had the most historically, of, historically, the most winners. Yes. So this is the second largest Powerball drawing okay. of all time. Okay. Previous one, which was just over two billion dollars, won last November. Where were they from? Guess where that player was from? California. California. Oh, two in a row. All right. So the next time one of these Powerball tickets get up to this, if I lived in California. I'd be buying a heck of a lot of Powerball tickets. I just have a friend who lives out there buy one for you. That's true. We could do that too. Yeah. But then you have to split because they technically went with you. And I guess if you're, if, I guess you if you're winning to, two billion, you need to negotiate the percentages ahead of time. I will help you do that. Exactly. I'll step in for you. All right, there. we got some time. All your markets action ahead, live from the Nasdaq market site. Hey, make a friend in California today. <laughs> Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We might be on Cornelia Street right now, but Taylor Swift is definitely not heartbroken. From a $5 billion tour to a new movie on the big screen, Taylor Swift is all anyone can talk about. And her superstardom is expanding beyond the Billboard charts and having an unheard impact on the U.S. economy. From increasing viewership for the NFL to getting blamed for inflation, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style. And we have all the details for you right here on Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the Nasdaq market site. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to crush and eliminate Hamas as more details emerge of the horror unleashed during the weekend attack. So far, Israel has put the Gaza Strip under total siege, stopping food and supplies from entering the enclave of more than two million people and continues to bomb the region with air raids. The initial attack, Hamas forces killed more than 1,200 Israelis and left some 2,800 people wounded. And the complexity of the campaign is raising questions on whether Hamas acted alone. Now, since the attack, U.S. officials have made note of Iran's longstanding support for the terrorist organization. Though Secretary of State Anthony Blinken noted on Sunday that he had not seen evidence Iran directed or was behind Hamas's recent attack. Regardless, though, there are growing calls for President Biden to refreeze $6 billion in Iranian assets released last month during a prisoner swap. U.S. officials say that the funds were only to be used for humanitarian goods, but Republican critics argue that the move freed up resources for Iran's military spending. For more on what the escalating tension in the Middle East means for the U.S. and the Biden administration, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joining us now. Rick, I know you're following this very closely, but just break down the significance, the importance of this and what this could mean for the U.S.'s relations in the Middle East going forward. So behind the scenes uh, during uh, the Biden administration, uh, Joe Biden's first, first three years in office, has been this effort to sort of make nice with Iran and actually um, not have to deal with Iran the way former presidents have had to. I mean, I Iran has been a problem for American presidents ever since the revolution there in 1979 when the uh, Ayatollahs took power. So Biden tried to go back to this uh, Obama-era deal uh, where uh, sanctions on Iran would be eased in exchange for limits on their nuclear weapons program. It didn't work. Iran basically said, nope, we're not doing that. So uh, the Biden administration has basically sort of been tacitly easing up on Iran. And an important reason for this is um, oil and gasoline prices. Um, Iran is uh, still a major uh, oil producer. The sanctions that have been in place for, for decades, a lot of those are targeted at limiting uh, the development of Iran's oil fields and its ability to export oil. And guess what? Uh, <clears throat> uh, oil prices and gasoline prices, as everybody knows, have been a big problem for Biden. So among the th Biden is trying to do a bunch of different things to get oil, more oil onto the market, and that includes um, trying to get Saudi Arabia to pump more. They basically said no. Sort of tacitly allowing Iran to export more, which has been happening. And the, uh, the hope or the belief was that um, we're kind of doing Iran a favor here. Maybe they, they will do us a favor and uh, not make so much mischief in the, in the Middle East. That actually seemed to be happening. But then we have this, uh, this Hamas attack on Israel. And uh, it, 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 Iran is Hamas's largest supporter, and it sort of guides the, uh, if not the activities of, of the group, at least the agenda of the group. So... It's not clear yet whether Iran was directly involved in this attack, but most experts say uh, Iran had to know what was going on here. Uh, and if they did not want it to happen, they could have stopped it. So if even if they weren't involved, they were they tacitly blessed this attack on uh, Israel, most likely. And Joe Biden now has to figure out what to do about that. OK, and so what is the most likely outcome here from from the White House and how they're expected to kind of go about this six billion dollars uh, well this six billion dollars is, is just one of several things that are going on with iran so this was th this is not u.s money this is not u.s taxpayer money if you see that on the internet that's wrong this is uh this is iranian money it's money that they earned by selling oil that has been basically snatched and held in an escrow account as part of those sanctions so iran had a number of American hostages. And the deal in September was basically give Iran $6 billion of its own money back, unfreeze it basically, in exchange for getting these five hostage, five Americans home. Um, and that's a good and a bad thing. I mean, so you're basically uh, incentivizing Iran to take more hostages. There's a clear moral hazard here. Um, you're paying a you're paying a ransom basically. But on the other hand, you get you get Americans come home and th those Americans could have frankly, died in Iranian prisons. So the, uh, apparently that money is in an account in the UAE, um, and it is not completely unfrozen yet. So it's possible that the United States could go back on its on that deal and say, 
oh, because of this attack on uh, on Israel that you uh, probably had some awareness of, we are going to take that money back or we're not going to make it available to you. I think we're also going to see um, some of those sanctions that were sort of not thoroughly uh, enforced for uh, for some period of time. We're going to see those tighten up. And by the way, this could mean that there's less oil on the global market and uh, prices could go up. And that is a major concern for Biden as he is campaigning for re-election. Certainly isn't something we're going to continue to track. Rick Newman, as always, thanks. Bye, guys. We got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. We also got the tailor-made economy breaking down the economic impact of Taylor Swift. That's coming up next. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Taylor Swift making music history today, announcing she's going back on tour after a five-year break. Pre-sales for her upcoming tour kicked off yesterday, but a surge in demand caused Ticketmaster's website to freeze or even crash altogether. There's so much fanfare around the summer that has been Taylor Swift. The Philadelphia Federal Reserve mentioned the impact that her tour had on the economy. Jersey sales for Travis Kelsey up 400%. His podcast is number one on the Apple charts, all because of Taylor. Get Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is breaking the internet again. Almost one year ago, singer-songwriter Taylor Swift began a journey that would change the American economy as we know it, starting with ticket sales for the Eras Tour. Over three and a half million people signed up for Ticketmaster's verified fan presale, but only 2.4 million tickets were ultimately sold. The unprecedented demand created a frenzy that resulted in a congressional hearing against the ticketing company, all while solidifying Swift's status as the world's biggest pop star. The tour kicked off in March of 2023 and has since blown up headlines and even landed in Philly's Fed report. Analysts expect the tour to pass the $1 billion mark during its international leg in March of 2024. That would be Elton John's nearly $940 million record for his farewell tour, which concluded in July. Swift's Eras Tour is also expected to generate as much as $5 billion in consumer spending in the US. People are dropping money on plane and hotel tickets, fun outfits and merch, $75 hoodies, $55 long sleeve shirts. And we didn't even talk about ticket prices with resale picks selling between $500 to $7,000 a pop. And in some cases, even higher. And that economic impact has only grown beyond the tour, with Swift now rumored to be dating Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Ticketing platform StubHub reported a 175% increase in ticket sales after she attended one of his games. And according to fan merchandise company Fanatics, Kelsey's jersey sales have increased by 400% since that first Swift appearance. And now her team is taking it one step further by releasing a big screen adaption of her popular era score. Pre-sales alone have already skyrocketed past the remarkable $100 million benchmark with more room to run as fans flock to theaters. Bottom line, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style anytime soon. No question about it, it has been the year of Taylor Swift. She has dominated the news and pop culture since the announcement of her Eras tour broke Ticketmaster at the end of 2022. Now, since then, she has broken sale records, boosted the economy, and also brought a new demographic to the NFL. We're going to be spending the next hour taking a deep dive into the impact that she has had on the economy, on marketing, and more. Joining us now for the next hour, we have Yahoo Finance a senior reporter, Alexandra Canal. And so guys, excited. It's so much to talk about yeah. here. I think I would have been... I was surprised by how much focus has been spent on Taylor Swift. It seems like everyone has been talking about our Jay Powell, like we just had in our package, even mentioned the impact or didn't dismiss the impact that she has had on the economy. Yeah, you just think about the local economies too, from the flights to the tickets to the merch. I know multiple people that traveled far and wide to go to this concert multiple times. The touch points that she has is just remarkable and it seems like you can't really replicate it. This is the pop star of our generation and we think about the summer, the girl summer that we had, not just with the Eras tour, but also Beyonce's Renaissance tour, the Barbie movie that helped boost GDP in the third quarter. In fact, uh, Fortune estimates that the tour could generate 4.6 billion in U.S. consumer spending. And that's just the Eras tour alone. And it comes at this perfect time where people want to get out there. The pandemic, people were at home. Now live events is, is where it's at. And in this era, no pun intended, of uh, you know inflation, consumers supposedly pulling back on their spending, that's not happening with T-Swift. Well, see, here's the thing. In the experience economy that has been, and as as you mentioned, it's movie going, Barbie, it's concert going, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, and it requires a great deal of execution to make sure that you're getting the omnichannel approach correct for all of these, whether it's in the movies, whether it's for the concert goers as well, and selling merchandise at every single turn here, and then also making sure that you stay in the news with a potential relationship as well for Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. And so all of this considered here, I have never defined myself as a Swifty, but I will say on a business mindset approach, 
I'm a little bit more Swifty adjacent at this point because of That's the execution. Big. That's a big that we've seen adjacent. Come okay, yes. okay, there we go. And you mentioned the news multiple times. Taylor Swift has been mentioned. The most unlikely place that Taylor Swift has popped up this year has been in financial news. Yahoo Finance reporter Josh Schaefer is here with every time Taylor's name was mentioned in that context. And Josh, I know you're a big Swifty. You volunteered yourself for this segment. So give us a breakdown. Yeah, Ali, I mean, candidly, I'm not that big of a Swifty, but even I haven't even been able to ignore her this year because she's been in our news. She's been in financial news really throughout the summer. So if we take a look at a timeline of when we started seeing Taylor Swift, we know that Errors Tour really kind of started in the spring. So then it trickles into economic data into the summer. She was mentioned in the Fed Beige book. Moody's called out Taylor Swift. There was a question to Fed Chair Jerome Powell about the Taylor Swift impact. And then Morgan Stanley highlighting at the end of the summer that the end of the era's tour is gonna mean slower right. consumption. So I wanna dig in a little bit as far as what we saw in different aspects of this. If you take a look at what the Fed Beige Book actually had to say about Swift, they wrote, despite the slowing recovery in tourism in the region overall, one contact highlighted that May was the strongest month for hotel revenue in Philadelphia since the onset of the pandemic in large part due to an influx of guests for the Taylor Swift concerts in the city. And then if you fast forward to what Moody's reported, you'll see Moody's highlighting the impact that we saw for hotels in different cities. So all the way to the right there is the average revenue for room in the total US growth. But look at the cities that Swift was in. Look at Newark, look at Philadelphia, look at Boston. Massive increases on those days when Taylor Swift was there. And then this one was my personal favorite, because we had this summer of Swift. Then at the end of the summer, Morgan Stanley comes out and says, seriously, for Q4, you should be worried about not having Taylor Swift. Now, this is combining Taylor Swift and Beyonce, also Barbenheimer, but you can see we were looking at 1.9% growth there and then actually potentially going negative in Q4 from what Morgan Stanley had projected back in August when you take out Swift, Beyonce, Barbenheimer. So without that girl economy, without that girl power economy that we talked a lot about over the summer, we might not have seen the resilient U.S. consumer that has kept us out of a recession. Josh, one performer being called out this many times by economic studies. I mean, how common is that if we were look at it from a historical perspective here? Brad, it is not common. So I, I talked to several economists when I was reporting on different stories about this over the summer and just simply said, you know, is this normal? And Tom Simmons over at Jefferies, who's been in the industry for about 15 years, said absolutely not. And one thing that we sort of came to a conclusion on is maybe this is Taylor Swift is our way of understanding the resilient consumer in the U.S. economy and what the story was over the summer. When we think about what the economic story has been for the U.S., it has been people willing to spend on services, willing to spend on experiences and willing to spend up on once in a lifetime experiences. And it seems like that's what Taylor Swift got at with this Eras tour. She was the perfect epitome of people being willing to spend on a once in a lifetime opportunity to see all these eras come together, to trade the friendship bracelets, to really have a moment and a concert that we haven't seen before. And so Taylor Swift really was a microcosm of the resilient US consumer. And I think that's why us in finance news were attracted to it. I think that's why people in the NFL have been attracted to it. Everyone loves talking T Swift. She speaks to everyone, and she's certainly spoken to us in finance news over the last six months or so. All right, Josh, my friendship bracelet to you is on the way from Etsy. It's in the mail right now, I've been told. All right, stand by. Stand wait. Coming your way. Appreciate it. Taylor Swift's Eras Tour has had an economic impact greater than 50 countries is where that impact has been felt, according to a recent study. Concert goers have been spending about $1,300 per show. If that pace continues through the end of the tour, it'll add an estimated $5 billion to the U.S. economy. Here with her insight into the economic juggernaut that is Taylor Swift is Enders Analysis Music Industry Analyst Alice Enders. Great to have you here with us this morning. Okay, so just round figures here as we think about that economic impact. What do you calculate that to be and where do you expect this to continue to kind of show itself strong? Well, we're seeing the same level of ticket prices, you know, all over the world. I think one of the important things that's going on outside uh, the U.S. is that Taylor's being really strict about resale. And uh, as you know, we're not really capturing the full uh, cost. Uh, you know, if someone spent seven thousand dollars on a on a ticket, you know, that obviously is going to bulk up ticket revenues. 
you know, the heart of this is, of course, the ticket sales themselves. But I think the thing that's really important about Taylor and the thing that really makes her so different from other people in the industry is, first of all, she's a singer, songwriter, performer. She's all by herself on stage. She only, you know, she she calls all the shots. And one of the most important things about Taylor is that she cultivates a, an incredibly strong relationship, direct relationship with her fans. Her, she is on the side of the fans and not on the side of the industry players, whether it's the venue operators or Ticketmaster or uh, anyone else, the record labels or whatever. And I think uh, that kind of personal connection, I haven't really seen that. Uh, to that extent, uh, in in certainly in the last couple decades, in terms of of uh, singer performers, I mean, I think Adele has a very strong connection with her fans, but uh, Taylor has taken it to uh, absolutely the top. And of course, she's only thirty three. Uh, she has a lot ahead of her. She's a prolific uh, musician. Uh, she's both re-recording uh, her masters and also, uh, you know, c composing new music all the time. There are so many reasons for her fans to get really excited about seeing her. And, and you know, with 150-some shows across the world, you know, it's uh, we're just starting to see the real impact. Now, one of the things that's different outside the U.S. is, of course, the fact that, you know, we're not going to have the same level of travel, hotel and so on, because, right. uh, you know, she's actually, you know, I mean, you know, we, you know, here in the U.K., she's going to be in all the major cities. Nobody really has to travel to go and see her. But the fact is that, you know, uh, the ticket uh, cost is is very steep. Um the merch, everything, mm -hmm. you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be there well, and to be, you Alice, know, really I, what I, we call bucket list. I, and I, and I want to pick up on that point because it seems like the Eras tour was perfectly timed, right? There's this craving for more live events, more concerts, especially post pandemic. What are the implications of that for the music industry at large? Does that mean we're going to see more uh, uh, artists touring and, and putting on these live performances? And does that mean the consumer is going to have to pay more because the demand is there? Well, I hate to surprise you with this, but actually the first time we really saw this experience economy was actually in 2008-09. Uh, that was, to me, very eye-opening. It was very similar in the sense that, uh, you know, economic times were difficult, but people just threw themselves into live music, and live music has really not stopped since then. In fact, as you know, you've seen the Rolling Stones go out on tour. We've seen a lot of vintage bands, let's put it that way, uh, get up and get out and get in front of fans. And the reason I think that is so important is that because, you know, um, uh, the fact is, is that this digitalization, the internet, everything, you know, there is nothing like live music. And so perhaps it was more that fans had forgotten about how amazing live music is. And so it has been a major arc across the last, you know, certainly 15 years in terms of what, you know, I call the experience economy and so on. I think what we're seeing is that fans are willing to pay a, an awful lot more but not for everyone. And there are tours that don't get off the ground. There are vintage bands that don't get booked. So it really has to be the top end of the industry. And there are not a lot of people occupying the top end of the industry. So I think uh, what we, we are seeing is uh, certainly uh, an appetite for live music, which has been there for a while, but of course was very, very profoundly suppressed during the pandemic. It's a social thing to go to a live music event. You don't go by yourself. You go with your friends and your uh, fan and your you know sort of fellow fans. And so it's it's yeah. an experience on multiple levels. But Alice, is this something though that can stick? Because I think that's what everyone is trying to figure out: how sticky this is. Because yes, consumers are prioritizing the experience right now that is where they're spending their money but when we talk about shifting spending trends is this something that you see remaining for the years to come i i do see it in live music 
as long as the acts are there, uh, you know, as we know, uh, Taylor has put an awful lot of effort into this, into the performance, into the entertainment, into, I mean, it is, you know, an encyclopedic uh, review of everything she's done. You know, you can't just uh, stand up and, 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 you know, I mean, there, there are so many production values that are surrounding her show. So it's, it's really got to be, you know, super worthwhile for the fans to go out there um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I do think, I, I think it is probably much more palpable in live music than, for example, in restaurants, you know, people are cutting back on going out for dinner. It's, a, it's an issue of shifting priorities, uh, but, you know, a, a must have, uh, you know, event once in a lifetime, maybe next summer too, but, um, yeah, I do. I do think it's going to be very sticky in a way that other experiences are not. Like, for example, the cinema has really suffered. Of course, she's drawing a lot of people back into the cinema, but it's different. You know, a, a, a film experience of the Eras tour is not the same as the live event. You know, you feel the music in your body. And I think the more people experience live music, the more they will want to go back and have that experience again. Well, the economic impact of Taylor Swift has certainly been staggering this year. Enders Analysis Music Industry Analyst Alice Enders, thanks so much. You're welcome. We got more on the impact from Taylor Swift this year and what that tells us about consumer demand and consumer spending trends going forward. More on that when we come back. Swifties rejoice Taylor Swift surprising fans by bringing her Eras tour to theaters a day earlier than planned. Early access showing begins today in the U.S. and in Canada, thanks to quote unprecedented demand for the concert film. 
Before the added showtimes, advanced ticket sales had already surpassed $100 million. Now, IMAX is upping the theater experience for fans with more immersive video quality and dynamic audio. More than 350 shows at IMAX theaters have already sold out. With more on how Taylor could shake up the movie industry, we want to bring in Richard Gelfon, CEO of IMAX. Richard, it's great to see you again. I'd love to get your perspective on this. Clearly, you've been in the industry for a very long time. Demand for this concert here at IMAX theaters, is it like anything that you've seen before? How would you characterize it? I think it's, it, we've seen demand like this, but we've seen it for big blockbuster movies. I don't think there's ever been a concert uh, film like this e ever before. And by the way, we could talk about it in a minute. The question is, will we ever see it again? I think Taylor is such a unicorn, such a special talent. This concert had so much publicity behind it. So many people couldn't see it. Pent up demand. It, it, it's definitely a milestone kind of in the history of cinema in terms of excitement around a concert movie. And Richard, how critical is it that this concert movie is debuting now, especially since the fall slate is a lot more bare compared to the summer? I think it, it, the, the timing is very fortunate, and that's because of the writer's strike, which we recently settled, and the actor's strike, which is ongoing. You know, a few things got moved around. So there was much more flexibility for exhibitors to, to show the concert film now. So for IMAX, um, not fortunately for us, not a lot got moved around. But the timing of this one is very interesting. Originally, Exorcist was supposed to open this weekend. But when Taylor got dated, for now, Exorcist actually moved back a week. So this one was so powerful, it was able to change the theatrical release schedule, which, again, is unprecedented it, it, inside the industry. Um, I, I, I think if you said a concert movie was going to make studios move their movies, you wouldn't have believed that in the abstract. Yeah, Richard, that's remarkable that October, Friday the 13th, is no longer Exorcist Day. It is Taylor Swift Day. And all this considered, I mean, look, you, you buy your, your ticket to the movies, you expect to sit down. People got dressed up for Barbie over the summer. People are probably going to get dressed up for this. And if I'm a Swifty going to see this, I'm probably not sitting down in my seat. Are you telling people to enjoy a different type of movie experience when you go see the Swift, uh, the Eras tour in feature film in IMAX? Well, I don't think you have to tell them. That's the good news. We, we did a smaller film, which was fantastic. A couple weeks ago, we did the Talking Heads, Stop Making Sense, and people were dancing in the aisles and jumping around. And it felt much more like a concert than it did a movie. And I think that's what's going to happen here, especially in IMAX. We have these huge speakers, very similar to concert speakers in the front and in the back. And you have this huge image. I think people are going to feel like they're in a concert. So, you know, again, if you watched it on streaming or you watched it in your house, I don't think you could capture that. But I think at, at, the, at the theater, and particularly in, in an IMAX experience, I think people are very much going to be transported as if they went to the concert, and I expect them to act in a similar way. Richard, you, you have more artists now documenting or putting this motion picture type of production around some of their tours and concerts. How does IMAX and people in your position look to really make sure that you can replicate that experience, even if it's not Taylor Swift, to make sure that people feel like they're going into a concert that they might not have been able to buy tickets for? And are there other artists that you think about doing that with now off of this potential success story? So in IMAX, we've been working on this for a number of years. So we've done Rolling Stones, um, concert, actually two different ones in IMAX. We did Metallic. I just mentioned Talking Heads. We did Brandy Carlisle. So it's a focus for us. But again, the reason it's partly a focus for us is because we're the kind of venue where you could really feel like you're at a concert. When you're at a concert, let's face it, you know, unless you're in the first few rows, you're watching a small image 
in person, but you're watching huge screens live and you're hearing that sound. So we think we're very close to that kind of experience. In terms of how does this change the future, you know, I, I, I think there are very few artists of the, of that have the drawing power of Taylor Swift or Beyonce, which, as you know, is going to come out shortly. So I think for the right talent, um, this is a seminal event. But I don't think that this is a threat to the regular movie-going experience because there are very few people who could pull these kind of numbers. And another important point is on the marketing side. I mean, a lot of talent would have to really spend a lot of money to market itself. You know, Taylor shows up at an NFL game or, you know, something goes on social media and they come, but not everyone has that drawing power. And Richard, you mentioned the strikes. We finally got the conclusion of the writer strike. The actor strike is still ongoing. How do you think some of the challenges the entertainment industry has seen in 2023 will play out at the box office next year? And could new opportunities like live concert events uh, be more the norm moving forward? So I think, Ali, it depends on how quickly it settles. I think if the actor strike settles relatively soon, I don't. I think 2024 will be mostly a normal year. And um, if it goes on much longer, which I don't think it will, and I hope it won't, I, you know, I think it will be a normal year. But with that said, I do think the, the, um, the draw of alternative content and the numbers we're gonna see this weekend are gonna make it clear that other cultural events work. I think, you know, we got kind of a little deluded during um, the pandemic that people wanted to sit in their living rooms. But I think for big cultural experiences, whether they're movies or concerts or sports events, we're definitely seeing a trend where people want to get out of their ho homes and they want to experience these things with other people in a shared experience. All right. Well, I'm very excited to see this movie. I definitely think IMAX is the way to go here. Richard Gelfon, IMAX CEO, thank you so much for joining us. See you at the movies, Allie. Yes, yeah, see you at the movies. And coming up, we have more Taylor Swift for you, including her impact on the NFL. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Taylor Swift's impact has expanded beyond the Billboard charts all the way to the NFL. Her rumored relationship with Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey and attendance at two of his games have driven fans and the NFL themselves into a frenzy. Jory Epstein, Yahoo Sports senior NFL reporter, joins us now with more. And Jory, break it down for us. Just how significant has the mere presence of Taylor Swift influenced some of these ticket prices along with viewership? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. And, and it is funny because all of these numbers are, of course, constantly in flux. But you see times where StubHub is saying, OK, these tickets are now three times expensive, where there's a 10 percent increase. I mean, all sorts of different numbers. And she first attended a game in Kansas City where the Chiefs played. Then it worked out well. They were in New York the next week. Taylor lives in New York. And I was at that game watching Taylor walk in with sort of this star-studded cast. And you definitely saw, I mean, I, I'm seeing fans who say, well, I usually come to these games. I'm an Aaron Rodgers fan, but he's not playing, so I'll wear my Aaron's tour shirt today. <laughs> Dory, what do you think of how the NFL has handled this? And I guess the ability here for the NFL to retain some of these new fans that they've gotten. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I've seen some people critical of it, like, oh, the NFL went overboard. And I'm like, these are two of America's biggest entertainment brands with an opportunity to cross over. Why not? Why not lean into it? Why not have fun with video or video image and photos of Taylor and Travis Kelsey's mom suite. I mean, that's great. So they definitely realize this is a growth opportunity for them in the audience in a way that maybe men 18 to 34 are not. They're leaning into it and they love it. <laughs> and Jory, how, how does the NFL leverage that growth opportunity and make sure that that momentum can stay even if Taylor Swift doesn't show up to every single game? Yeah, I mean, I think I will tell you there were numbers that came out from this pack we past weekend's Cowboys at San Francisco 49ers game being like, hey, look, women watch this one, too. It was a big game. Women watched. And I think that's sort of what the NFL is realizing that, yes, there were people who were tuning in to see Taylor Swift, but women like football. I mean, clearly, I, I have a little bit something to say about that. But I think that the NFL is saying, like, let's make this a fun experience. Let's make this something where we're constantly thinking about all of our opportunities. This doesn't need to be the end of it. This is just the beginning. I mean, these are these are like free points, a free kick that the NFL is essentially getting here. Um, and I hate to confuse football references, but at the same time, that's just what it is, especially when they've tried to annex kind of the celebrity appeal. Uh, yeah, great. Bradley Cooper loves the Eagles. So should you. I mean, I'm already an Eagles fan. I didn't need Bradley Cooper to tell me that. But hey, <laughs> if Taylor Swift, who, by the way, I believe was an Eagles fan, is now a Chiefs annex, well... That's, I guess, another reason why you should like one of the most popular teams in the league. How, how is the NFL going to successfully go about the celeb washing, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I think what's funny is that you might say, well, why does the NFL need Taylor Swift? They're already getting the top 10 ratings, et cetera, et cetera. And then numbers come out this week that may be higher now that Travis Kelsey has gained 1.1 million Instagram followers since the Taylor Swift news started to percolate. So this is something where they can say, we are seeing the numbers reflect this. Now, the NFL did some things like their official Twitter account was changing their photos and their byline to Taylor Swift and lyrics and, and, and images. They got a little bit of backlash of that because there was a controversial officiating call at the end of the game and people were saying, oh, you just wanted the Chiefs to win because Taylor was there. But I think they will continue to lean into it. They probably are taking a couple weeks off the pedal because of that criticism. But I don't think this is over. And I'll be at the league meetings next week and we'll ask, like, what are your plans to carry this forward? All right. I can't wait to see some of the predictive analytics around this with the Taylor Swift factor layered in as well. Jory Epstein, Yahoo Sports senior NFL reporter. Jory, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, before her NFL takeover, Taylor Swift was breaking the internet in a different way, the Eras Tour. After three and a half million people signed up for pre-sale for the tour's first leg, only 2.4 million tickets were actually sold, leading to some bad blood between fans and ticket sites as they upped their budget to secure a seat. But from travel to shelter costs, the tour is now expected to generate over five billion dollars for the U.S. economy alone. For more on this, we're joined by Matt Farrell, who is the TickPick VP of Growth. All right, why was this debacle taking place on ticketing sites, and, and, and how can we reel this in, Matt? Because even I, and I haven't been able to afford to go to a Taylor Swift concert this summer, but heck, at the normal prices, I would have loved to. I would have loved to support. But the resale is getting out of control here, it feels like. 
Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw was a outpaced demand for supply. Uh, there are very few artists that have the level of demand that Taylor does. Um, and even football stadiums can't really contain the number of fans that are looking to go. And and so what we saw really was trying to balance the volume of shows, uh, the volume of seats needed, and the number of fans became really quite complicated and the prices rose to meet that demand. Matt, what did you see just from your data in the ticket sales for these NFL games? How big of a jump are you seeing on your platform? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, we just got a update today uh, that Taylor is rumored to be at the Chiefs Broncos game. Um, so we'll see what the long lasting effect is going to be of of what that jump is. But we did see a fairly substantial rise for the Jets game. Um, we saw an increase of nearly 63 percent, and it, and it was one of our top selling games of the year. Uh, once the announcement was made that Taylor was going to be there. So it really becomes sort of an interesting ancillary benefit to two very, you know, compelling teams and compelling markets. But it also shows, as as mentioned, like she brings a fan base of her own outside of the NFL audience. And Matt, going back to her tour, I'm curious from your perspective in this business, was the Eras tour a once in a lifetime phenomenon in terms of the reaction, the demand? How did it stack up compared to some of the other live concerts and events on your platform? You know, I've been in the live event space for a long time, putting on tours and, and would I call it once in a lifetime? No. Would I call it a absolute milestone tour? Absolutely. Um, when we talk about the volume of seats and the average ticket price for this tour, as mentioned, it really got quite severe in terms of the cost. I mean, the average for to put in context, the average purchase price was around fourteen hundred dollars a ticket. You know, the average concert in 2023 is $188. So we're talking about most venues uh, are not the size of football stadiums, and she was still able to drive that demand. The next closest we're looking at is the Adele residency in Las Vegas, and that reached $1,300 a ticket, but that venue pales in comparison to the size uh, of what Taylor was playing. So it, it really was quite a uh, an anomaly in the touring space and and as you mentioned it may be a once in a lifetime experience matt when you looked across the different cities that we're seeing perhaps the the biggest sales or at least maybe the biggest overlap because i would imagine that there's some data where you could see where someone is is actually purchasing from versus where the event is actually taking place how much of that overlap were you seeing people willing to travel in order to see these concerts? Yeah, I mean, I think you see it in the major metro markets, New York and Los Angeles, obviously having the most volume of shows. Um, and we saw people willing to make a summer trip out of it. Uh, the tour concluded, at least the front half of the tour, she will be playing dates in, in 2024 uh, in Los Angeles. And we would see people start price comparing, all right, with these ticket prices, what is the cost of a hotel? What is the cost of a flight? And there are certain markets where you could actually justify flying to uh, to actually get a cheaper experience all in um, because of the level of cost for this particular tour. So we did see a number of uh, a number of markets that drove more out of state transactions uh, transactions than others. But um, yeah, we saw the same with Beyonce as well. People flying to Europe to go see her early days tours um, for this particular mm -hmm. tour. Matt, I'm curious when you take a look at who is buying tickets and not for the tour, but going back to the NFL, because it certainly has been remarkable when you take into account how many new fans are now tuning into games just because Taylor is there. Have you noticed anything on your platform just about who is buying these tickets? I think we're seeing, you know, outside of the men 18 to 34 demo and, and men just in general from a transactions, I would say that this has been a ongoing trend. I think the diversification of fan base within most major leagues, but specifically NFL, has been in the making for years. Um, it does not hurt um, that probably the largest entertainer in the world um, is also advocating and, and supporting this league. And so we are seeing uh, a different mix of transactions um, in, in this particular year. And, and it's encouraging. It's showing that these fan bases and that these leagues can continue to grow. 
um, even multiple years, multiple decades into existence. This is something that new fans can come to. Um, and, and, you know, having the support of the largest musician in the world uh, does not hurt that. Doesn't hurt at all. All right, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to jump on with us. Tick pick of VP of Growth. Thanks. Thank you. Well, a Swifty-fueled shopping spree. How Taylor Swift fans are spending big on sneakers, on sauces, and football tickets. Stay tuned. We've got all that for you when we come back. Live from the NASDAQ in New York City, gone are there times that entertainers only drove sales of their own merchandise because now anything that they're associated with is making big bucks, especially if you're Taylor Swift. Now, that's especially true here for the queen of music right now. She sold out sneakers, inspired sauce, and she's even increasing some sales for Halloween costumes. So let's talk about all of this and break it down because first, guys, what jumped out to me was how quickly Halloween outfits are selling Halloween costumes that are geared towards Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. So some mm. data here looking at some of the trends that we're seeing so far. We still got about three weeks until Halloween, but there is a company called uh, Three uh, Three Wishes right now. It's an online Halloween uh, store saying that they're already sell sold out of this outfit here for Travis Kelsey and for Taylor Swift. Of course, you can be creative and do a little DIY project, but they're saying they're trying their best to get everything back in stock. They expect it later this month, but it's the second fastest selling product in the company's history, second only to the Tiger King costume a couple of years ago. <laughs> oh, no. We still got three weeks to go. I have a feeling this is going to be their top seller, but really just highlights the impact that Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, the relationship there, what that's doing here for many industries. I thought it would be Barbie and Ken. Yeah. You know, that was the guarantee. There's and the so many different funny, versions. There's so many different versions. Yeah. We have the movie this summer. The funny thing is, is apparently Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, the real life versions, they joked about being Barbie and Ken for wow. Halloween. And now in this multiverse we're living in, people want to be Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift. I would think this would be a very easy costume very to pull easy off to do at yourself. home. I don't even think you need to go out and purchase something, but the amount, I mean, especially if they continue their relationship where it looks like they are, I feel like this is gonna just explode on Halloween. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, one thing that I've been looking across is the impact on sneakers here. I mean, mm. sneakers, that's 
amazing to watch. StockX has latched onto this as well. They have an entire, and I laughed a little bit. This is the sneaker that she wore to the first Chiefs game that she showed up to. And afterwards, now you've got StockX curating a, what they call a list of sneakers that are on StockX that you will love all too well. Taylor's version, <laughs> what they call it there, but featuring a lot of the New Balances. And she's been rocking some New Balances just in casual life and public out there. And so no doubt New Balance seeing one of, even as we had spoken to Joe Preston, who was the CEO of New Balance previously, and him talking about how the Gen Xers and Millennials are gravitating towards the brand, this is only going to be lighter fluid on top of that. Yeah, and just to go through some of those numbers there that you were just seeing on your screen. Now, this is according to an internal presentation that was cited by Complex. Revenue for that sneaker, which is the New Balance 550, that mm -hmm. was up 25% in the week following her appearance, while units sold jumped 22%. And then you had site traffic to the New Balance 550 uh, website, also increasing by double digits, up 30% as internal searches surged by 73%. Are you, are you going to disclose that you bought yeah, 550 you buy? the week before? <laughs> I will give you credit. We discussed it. It was the week before Taylor showed up at the game with 550s. But, Brad, you're in on the trend, too. But you know what? I am in on the trend. And here's the thing. I had to get ahead of where everybody <laughs> else was going to start going. I knew that they were so going we to pick up the 550s. You more. I had to pick up, but I had to put my, my little flair on it. I had to get the lavender purple Rich Paul 550s, who just had his 60 Minutes feature, who has been crushing it. He's got his new book out. So I got the Rich Paul edition, but I did still get some 550s, and I was a little bit influenced. <laughs> okay, but but would you try this new condiment that Kraft Heinz is coming it's out with? It is ketchup and seemingly ranch. Now, this is based off a viral tweet of Taylor Swift eating a chicken nugget with ketchup and seemingly ranch. Craft, I mean, they jumped in on this opportunity. They're making limited edition 100 bottles of this. Now, the 100 number is significant because Travis Kelsey's jersey is 87. Taylor Swift's lucky number is 13. Hence, the 100 bottles that okay. will be available. But it just seems like this, it was an authentic moment for them to get in and create this sauce, this condiment, if you will. It's just crazy, though, to see a company, a public company for that matter, try and jump on this Taylor Swift craze. Uh, look, I'm still trying to get my hands on the Cardi B whip shots. How am I going to get my hands on this? I know, only 100 bottles. You know that's going to sell out very, very You're not, quickly. but you can very easily make this. I can make yourself, this? Right? It's like special Ketchup sauce. and ranch sauce. At least that's what <laughs> it sounds like. Right, you could just yeah. combine the two. It's pretty easy to make inside your I would definitely try it. Hopefully they added a little bit of flair to it. I feel like it would be good if it had a little bit of like spice. A little, little yeah, exactly. throw a little pepper in there. I don't know, but it's so smart, and it also just goes with the trend that so many of these companies like this here just trying to do anything they can to muster up a little bit of tension to boost sales here. So very smart move, and they did it quickly. And they did it quickly, and Google searches uh, went up on that as well. So, you know, all these companies getting on the action. And look, it's clear that Taylor Swift is a marketing master without really trying. The NFL is worth over $140 billion, but when Swift goes to a game, they take advantage of it. They even change their X headline photo. So for more on the marketing mania, that is Taylor Swift. We want to bring in Marcus Collins. He is the University of Michigan Raw School of Business marketing professor. He is also an author. Thank you so much for joining us, Marcus. So first, blanket statement here. When you think about Taylor Swift and, and how she is this marketing mastermind, I'm going to uh, play to some of her songs there. Why? How has she kind of cultivated this identity? I think what Taylor Swift has done is twofold. One, she has identified who she is beyond just being an artist, beyond just being someone who makes music. She's an icon. She represents something. She represents a certain brand of feminism. And so she transcends the category in which she operates. The second part is that she's cultivated a, a community not just fans who like the music, but a group of people who self-identify by their membership in the community, i.e. Swifties. And therefore, they see the world similar to the way, the way that Taylor Swift does, and her personhood becomes a way by which they represent their identity. And that's super powerful for brands writ large. Marcus. I gotta admit, even I'm becoming a convert here. I, I've watched the documentaries. I've looked at potentially purchasing tickets to the concert here, and I, I feel like every day I'm growing closer to the official title of Swifty. I'm not there yet, but 
give her so much credit for how well the team around her and herself have been able to put on a show that brings everybody in and gives them a sense of what to expect. You look around her and all of the capitalizing on where there's merchandise and where they can continue to make sure that she's in the public spotlight and now the movie. So all of these things considered, what is the lesson that anyone who is trying to market themselves should take away from Taylor Swift? Yeah. Well, her, everything around Taylor Swift's orbit is perfectly curated. But I think the major takeaway for marketers, for leaders, for entrepreneurs, for anyone who's trying to present themselves to the world in a compelling way, is that you have to start with how do you see the world? What's your worldview? What's your ideology? The point of view you have on the world. And everything that you do should be a demonstrative representation of that, an expression of that. We see that in her music, we see it in the way that she lives her life, we see it in the things that she speaks out about. These things are all reflections of who she is. So for marketers, for brands, for, for content creators, we have to ask ourselves, who are we? And then who sees the world the way we do? And how do we use our resources trying to facilitate connection? Facilitate those covalent bonds that connect us with people. When that happens, we activate a network effect that starts to reverberate into the population, i.e. converting you. Taylor Swift isn't talking to you, but it is the cacophony of the people who are now a part of this community that is that is per, that is persuading you to go a certain way, to consume a certain thing, and to self-identify a certain way. And that is unbelievably powerful. Mark is a prime example of this, and a company here trying to really capitalize on Taylor Swift's brand is the NFL. What do you think? of this strategy that we've seen from the league over the last couple of weeks and what that really signals just about the direction or the hope that the league is trying to steer the direction towards uh, in the future. The league is definitely benefiting from the Taylor Swift effect. And so I say the Taylor Swift network effect. But I think that the, what the league has to realize is that this is temporal and that people's attention is because of their, uh, their proximity to Taylor. But if Taylor stops coming to games, if she stops attending because her travel schedule picks up, then if there's not any, any relevance between the game and those people who are there because of their affiliation with Taylor, then those people are definitely going to we're going to lose those people, right? There's going to be a, an attrition of those folks. So the NFL should be thinking about what is it about who they are as a brand and a, a branded product that is the game and who are these people and how do we find congruence in a meaningful way? I mean, the most interesting part about all this is that, like, Taylor didn't even wear a jersey to that first game, right? But the, ta the, the jersey sales went up. And that means that w within these people, these communities of people, they were negotiating what is acceptable behavior for people like themselves. And that's the unbelievable part. That is the most powerful part about Taylor Swift, her ability to facilitate community. She didn't wear the jersey. She wasn't sure if she if Tay wanted to be Bay just yet, mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe at a future game, she'll be rocking a jersey. Who, know, who knows? I'm just going to throw that out there, Marcus. But even as we think about the economic impact that Taylor Swift, that Beyonce, that Barbie have had over the course of this summer, it has been the summer of women powering the economy through some of the marketing, through some of the events. And now for a person like Taylor, who knows herself, who knows her audience as well, how powerful all of this could be going into, I'll be the person to say it, going into a 2024 general election. How powerful do many of these themes also transpire into next year? Yeah, I mean, we see a common theme between Beyonce, Taylor, and, and, and Barbie. It's not just because they were women-led, but because they are representing a brand of feminism, a, an ideology a point of view about the world. And if we look at current politics, there's a lot of attack on women, on women's personhood, on women's autonomy, on their agency. And the whole the idea uh, scenario is that these outlets, these vehicles become cultural, uh, cultural vessels by which people can engage in conversation in such a way that is reflected in how they vote. I mean, I think the most powerful thing of all of this is that people aren't consuming because of what these things are. They're consuming because of who they are, because of their cultural mm -hmm. subscription, how they see the world. And it's being manifested or made material through their consumption. And the hope as we enter into a political season that we'll see those things manifest in the way in which people show up to the ballot box, the way people advocate for, for certain policies, and the way people show up uh, in communities to, to, to guide a certain uh, agenda forward. 
Marcus Collins, University of Michigan, Ross School of Business, marketing professor and author. Marcus, always a pleasure to get some of your insights. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, Taylor Swift's economic impact in the U.S. is expected to surpass $5 billion. But how much have you spent on her this year? We've got a study from Question Pro that found consumers spent an average of $1,300 per show, and 91% would still go again. I don't know if I could do a repeat spend of that much, but mm -hmm. hey, 91% of people would out there, Allie. Yeah, I, I think if you're a Swifty, you're willing to spend so much money and you're willing to do it multiple times. And now with this movie coming out, I guarantee you that most of the people in that theater oh, yeah. probably went and saw a concert, but they're willing to continue to spend on Taylor Swift for Taylor Swift merchandise. They'll probably dress up as Taylor Swift mm -hmm. and maybe drag one of their friends or boyfriend to be Travis Kelsey for Halloween as well. I just think the Swifties are, are hardcore and you don't really have average fans for Taylor Swift. It's really all in or nothing, mm. it feels like. Yeah, certainly. And you, Ali, you talk about the fact that Swifties are all in. And I think that was also reflected in the results that we got from the Yahoo Finance poll that we put up on X. And from these results, 10% of people who weighed in said that they actually spend over $1,000. And I think that that's pretty indicative of what we're seeing play out in the broader economy as well, right? right? When you take into account the number of people who are diehard Swifties and the number that are willing to spend over $1,000, and it sounds like from the ticket prices, you almost need to spend $1,000 dollars if you want to go to one of these shows and have decent seats given the demand and given the resale value that we've seen on so many of these tickets. So people are willing to spend. But I also think that the question here going forward is what this tells us about the broader picture of where people are spending in the economy, whether or not consumers are going to continue to favor those experiences, continue to go out there and spend that way, or if we are going to see the shift. And also, if there's any other artists out there, and there are quite a few very, very popular artists that have been able to attract a pretty penny for their ticket prices, but I guess how large that audience could potentially be and who is next is what people are wondering about too. I just think about the concerts that I paid to go see, and then I think about the fact that I even still loaded up these apps to try and figure yeah. out if I could get tickets to Beyonce in a different city. I almost went to see Beyonce in Houston. Almost, couldn't uh, fly plus concert it was tickets. Expensive. It's expensive, Wait, it's expensive. I'm curious always. how much you guys have spent on a concert. Uh, probably the most this year that I've ever spent on, on a concert. I, I went to see Coldplay in Barcelona. Okay. Yeah, it was a fun experience. I did not know Barcelona gets down with Coldplay like they do. Oh, how Coldplay much did you pay for the global ticket? audience? Yeah, you're, 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 I, I can't you disclose that. I, pay, I paid a lot. I paid a lot for these tickets. That was not you're what slightly I was embarrassed by how much you paid, but you, you, you yeah. paid a lot. I paid a lot. I paid a lot. I, I, I don't I, think I paid over two hundred bucks to go to. Okay, Coldplay. that's usually my my breaking yeah. point. I did pay like four fifty to go see John Mayer. I love him. Okay. I never saw him before. I wanted to listen to his music. Four fifty to see John Mayer. Okay, he's he's good. Talk about. <laughs> he's good. Shut up. <laughs> he's good. He's like, Who's solo tour? Okay. I would. I would go again. Although next time, I think two hundred to two fifty is mine. Yeah, that sounds I nice probably spend a little over two hundred. Now <laughs> I think about it for certain ones, but it just highlights that these artists certainly do yes. get people to spend a heck of a lot of money. And also the big takeaway, Taylor Swift certainly having a massive impact on the U.S. economy and the global economy this year. Well, guys, we got to leave that discussion there. Coming up next hour, Kiko Vegeta has you taking you through a noon Eastern time. She's coming up right after the break. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita. Here's what I'm watching at this hour. Sticky inflation. Consumer prices come in a touch hotter than expected in September. Signaling pricing pressures are still stubborn. The Fed keeps reminding us it's data dependent. So what's it going to make of this report? Plus, you may want to skip the double protein the next time you visit Chipotle. The fast casual chain announcing more price hikes to come, but do consumers need their burrito fix at any cost? And striking on, we look at the latest roadblock in the ongoing negotiations between actors and Hollywood studios as the clashing sides fail to reach an agreement. We're going to discuss what this means for the content pipeline. That's a little later this hour. First, though, let's do a check of the markets. We are 90 minutes into the trading day right now. The Dow down 100 points, the S&P 500 down four, and the Nasdaq up 14. In terms of sectors that we are seeing today, consumer staples, as well as materials and real estate among the biggest decliners on the day. We have been watching treasury yields tick up higher as well on the back of that slightly hotter than expected inflation print. The 10-year yield right now at 465, up about six basis points. Well, headline consumer prices held steady in September, up 3.7% year on year. That is a touch ha ahead of expectations while core inflation cooled slightly on an annual basis. Let's break down the numbers with Yahoo Finance reporters Danny Romero and Jared Blickery. They're looking at key sectors that drove those prices higher. Let's go first to Danny. Danny, I know you've been watching shelter inflation among the largest contributor to CPI this month. Akiko, shelter, the shelter index was a surprise to the upside. One economist from Ernest Young told me that they this was larger than expected, and he was expecting a little bit more of the disinflationary momentum. And if we look under the hood of the shelter index, the component of what are the drivers that are driving that index specifically, real-time data shows that rents are flattening out on a yearly basis. Second, owner's equivalent rent, that's hypothetically the rent that you would pay to uh, to your property, to your own property, reflects home prices. And so there's been a little bit more persistence in that area. Home prices have definitely gone up, uh, but due to the fact of the lack of supply on the market. But some economists are expecting that on a monthly basis, the shelter index will actually come down. Now, some have said that that could happen in October, in the later month of this, the later half of this year. Uh, another part that really stood out from this report was the tenants and household insurance. And that really is a function of higher home values and higher risks, whether that could be some climate change that factors into that. But overall, Akiko, uh, one economist told me that paradoxically, this is actually a really good signal ahead to what we could see in the inflation picture overall. Jared, I know you've been watching autos closely there up and down this year. What do we see in September? It depends on whether or not you want to buy a new car or a used car. And let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I have both mapped out and they're going in different directions. First, you can see new vehicles here heading up. Uh, that's we have the wrong direction. That's why we have that red arrow there, up two and a half percent. Uh, that's year over year. And then used vehicles, those are going down 8%. So let's take a look at the time series. This is going to go back all the way to the 1950s. This is used cars and trucks CPI. This is the raw index number. What stands out, um, we have a couple of long-term trends here between the 70s and 2000. Then we kind of stagnated. But then the recent era, that's a pandemic at work there, you can see just exploding to the upside and to the downside. And you can really see the value oscillations here when you take a look at the year-over-year -year numbers. And this is a change uh, from exactly 12 months ago. And you can see we spiked all the way almost up to 50% for used cars and trucks. That's when we had uh, supply chains. We we're talking about that every day and those disruptions. Fortunately, that's largely in the rear view mirror. But now we have to worry about inflation from labor and the fact that UAW uh, is striking. So let's take a look at the new car prices here. Here's new vehicle CPI, that is still heading up here. That is not inflected down uh, since we began, since that pandemic rise. And then here's another look. Here's the year over year change. You can see the growth is heading down, but the number, the raw number there is still increasing there. So good news that we're off of the highs, but still seeing new vehicles um, 
really add to those cost pressures. And then let's just take a look at some stocks here. I have uh, used car dealers, and this is uh, on a year-to-date basis. You can see a lot of green there. Carvan is a standout. That's up 600% after being absolutely decimated. But you take a look at what's happened over the last two months when we saw the overall market kind of roll over. Uh, it was not a very good uh, environment for some of these stocks here. And then I can also take a look at our new car manufacturers. This is over the last two months, too. It looks a little bit better because Toyota Motors, a big company there, up 8.6%. Tesla, another big company, that's up 8%. Uh, but for the most part, most of these stocks in the red as well. So uh, the environment that we have right now with regard to whether or not you're in the market for a new car or auto depends on, uh, I guess, which which we which you're in the mood for here and also for buyers of stocks of these companies just know that these have suffered as of late um, and they're looking for their footing right now as is uh, the general market yeah regardless of what car you buy those monthly rates still very high given where rates are right now uh, jared blickery and danny romero breaking down those sectors for us thanks so much well not too hot and not too cool. We got that pretty steady consumer price index inflation print this morning. The rate for all items rising 3.7% in September. This follows a report from wholesale producers which showed that inflation in that sector remains sticky. We did see core inflation, which includes food and energy, cool slightly to 4.1%. That prompted President Joe Biden to say in a statement that this is Bidenomics in action. We have Jared Bernstein, the chair of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors, joining us today. Jared, always good to talk to you. It feels like a bit of good and bad, right, in the inflation print. We we're talking about core inflation cooling down here. But we saw super core inflation. This is services excluding housing and energy, something that Fed increasingly is looking at. Um, that monthly gain was the fastest we've seen in a year. What do you think has made that so sticky? Well, I think you have to be careful in any given month. I mean, there was a, a actual a hotel lodging spike, a big swing there uh, that uh, looked kind of anomalous. I think that the general trend here is worth uh, beginning with, and that's the idea that inflation, headline inflation, the CPI is down 60% off its peak. Uh, remember, uh, if we were talking in June of uh, last year, we'd be talking about a number that was uh, north of 9%. So 3.7 uh, is 60% uh, down from that. And of course, core inflation fell to its uh, lowest level in more than two years, the year over year rate. Uh, wages are actually higher in real terms than they were a year ago. And then prices for uh, some of the core goods like used cars and furniture uh, fell for the fourth month in a row. You know, eggs is a very salient price in this economy, ticked up a touch in September, but they're down 57 percent. So that's deflation off of their peak. So I think if you look at the longer term trends, you can definitely see uh, the kind of easing in the data that uh, is something we're very much uh, uh, pulling for. Energy is certainly a big contributor to inflation in the last month, although we did see a pullback in uh, oil prices prior to the fighting between Israel and Hamas breaking out there. Um, what's your assessment right now from the White House in terms of how the current conflict that's playing out right now is likely to contribute to a spike in energy prices? If this doesn't unravel beyond Israel and Hamas, is the expectation that prices could remain pretty steady? Uh well, this is a very much a global price, as as you know. And 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 prior to uh, uh, prior to the uh, events uh, beginning last weekend, uh, horrific events, um, uh, obviously, uh, we had uh, oil coming down, and in fact, that's kind of stuck since then. And so, the gas price, as of this morning, uh, the retail gas price was uh, three dollars and sixty five cents a gallon. Okay, so that's actually lower than uh, was reflected in today's CPI report. And it's a uh, dollar thirty-seven below its peak of of last summer. So that's real savings per gallon. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, you know, just a, a few weeks ago, we were looking at gas prices that were north of of three eighty. So that's been that's been a nice movement. Now um, we will, of course, watch the impact uh, of uh, global events, whether it's uh, Ukraine or or now Israel uh, on on, uh, on on global oil markets. Uh, but the, the the price thus far has not been uh, hugely affected. Uh, aside from that, we, we've also seen sort of those prices remain elevated because of the production cuts coming through from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. As the White House sees it, do those extension of the cuts, do, 
Does the demand justify that? Well, I think that the uh, production cuts, uh, of course, are very much priced into the numbers that we were just talking about. And so um, demand and supply uh, are moving around in ways that I think are uh, even harder than usual to predict where oil markets are settling. Um, and again, you know, geopolitical headwinds of the type we just talked about. I think we just have to look at the price, look at the forward curves uh, in the futures markets. And there we see uh, a story that when you get to the pump, which is the end of the line that matters so much when we're talking about consumer prices, has been um, uh, favorable in terms of its trend. So we have a gas price that's uh, 365 this morning. Uh, last month, the average was north of 380. Uh, so that's a movement in the right direction. We'll just have to keep watching how those uh, how those uh, factors all equilibrate in coming weeks. Uh, let's talk about where yields have been moving, obviously off of the highs that we saw recently, but I'm looking at the 10-year right now at 4.6%, the 30-year yield below that 5% level at 4.7%. Obviously, the higher yields mean higher costs. The government needs to spend uh, paying back its debt. As we talk about the budget deficit and spending certainly in focus over in D.C., how does this shift that we have seen in yield how does it shift the administration's calculation uh, in terms of budget priorities? Well, the budget priority, getting on a sustainable fiscal path, is something that uh, we've judged to be an important part of our agenda ever since we got here, regardless of the bips and bops and rates. Um, I'll say a bit more about that in a second because it's a, a, a timely question. But I think in the context of our discussion today, which has really been about headwinds and tailwinds, <clears throat> We should remember that one of the reasons for higher for longer is because growth has surprised to the upside. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you and your colleagues have talked a lot about uh, different types of landings and lots of market folk for predicting recessions. And they've they've certainly, uh, you know, turned that pencil around and erased uh, those forecasts. And so the, the, the stronger growth that we've seen, uh, I'm sure you've seen estimates for Q3 GDP. We've had an unemployment rate that's below, been below 4% for 20 months in a row. We just had a, a gangbuster job. Now, this is it. When, when President Biden and I talk about the economy, uh, what he wants to know are how, how are middle class workers doing? What are their job options like? What are their real wages doing? Which, you know, as we learned this morning, real wages are up over the past year. And that's a trend that's been persistent for the past few months. And we have to build on that. I'm not suggesting our work is done by a long shot. We need to see the labor market maintaining its tightness while prices continue to ease so we can maintain those trends. But it's that kind of strength, particularly the American consumer who's benefited from those dynamics, keeping this economy going. And yes, that's created some upward pressure on rates. Now, when you get to the budget, um, we have a plan that reduces the deficit by $2.5 trillion over 10 years. We're going to continue to fight for that. And uh, I would say the current uh, dynamics that you described make that fight even more urgent. Uh, finally, uh, you know, over in the House, uh, we've got Steve Scalise being nominated to be the next House Speaker. Uh, certainly that vote far from done, but that does suggest uh, more of a shift to the right, if you will, if you consider from where Kevin McCarthy was in terms of policy. Um, how does that change the calculus for the White House in terms yeah. of the policy it believes it can push through? in this Congress? Oh, look, the White House is a, a fairly complex operation with lots of people working on lots of different things. Of course, my uh, lane is the economy. And let me say this about, about your question. I'm not going to get into the politics and who's going to prevail and what, uh, you know, what this says about the party or whatever. Here's the way I look at this. Um, you and I have been talking about the economy. We've been talking about prices. We've been talking about gas prices. If you're not helping to push back on higher prices the way we are through lower prices for prescription drugs, lower prices for clean energy, lower prices for insulin, pushing back on junk fees. If you're not helping to maintain the tight labor market that we've seen, um, if you're not helping to do work on behalf of the American middle class and instead are engaged in you know, a set of fights that take you away from that, and I'm not even getting into the geopolitical exigencies that are, of course, so uh, so so present right now, um, then I think you need to figure out how to uh, uh, correct that course. So you know if you're not if you're not willing if you're not out of the cart helping to push it forward, uh, that's where you need to figure out how to get. I mean these folks are are sent here 
uh, to Washington to do the work of the American people. It's certainly what President Biden instructs his team to do every day, and that's what we're trying to do. And we've seen some progress on inflation. We've seen some progress on the job market. We've certainly seen good progress on overall growth. Um, and so that's that's where, you know, at least for the econ team, that's where our heads are in that space. Uh, finally, Jared, you know, I've heard you point to the progress that you have seen in the economic picture. And yet every poll we look at still points to the president uh, mm -hmm. struggling with voters in terms of the perception of his handling of the economy. I've seen the White House double down on Bidenomics over the last several months. Why are you so convinced that that's a winning strategy when, when the perception, regardless of the data, is not good right now in terms of the president and the economy? Well, I probably would correct the uh, per the the, the uh, conclusion about the perception in the following way. If you ask people about the internal components of Bidenomics, investing in manufacturing, investing in clean energy, um, and, and not just uh, the, IR, the Inflation Reduction Act, but also the Infrastructure Act and the CHIPS Act, standing up domestic semi uh, semiconductor production here, standing up the domestic production of EVs and the whole supply chain therein, uh, the co cost reductions I talked about a second ago, ask them about insulin, ask them about clean water, getting you know, replacing lead pipes, you're going to get poll numbers that are north of 80%. So one thing to do is um, get down and, and, and you know roll up your sleeves and ask people um, what Bidenomics uh, components are doing for their, their lives to get a very different result. But that doesn't mean I discount the polls that you mentioned. They're real, they're saying something, no question. And I think there you have to recognize that the American people have been through a lot. Um, the geopolitical uh, upheaval that we've been talking about, and I'm not just talking about Israel, but of course Ukraine, uh, before that a uh, pandemic of the likes we haven't seen for 100 years, a 40 year inflation from which we're down 60%, supply chain upheaval, conflict with uh, you know, our, 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 uh, our dealings with, uh, with uh, uh, countries in Asia. So look, uh, people have been through a lot. And what we need to do is to maintain a strong labor market, uh, and I think you see that in the data, continue to uh, do everything we can to put downward pressure on prices and uh, keep, this, um, keep this positive expansion going. And that uh, enables enough time for people to reset their expectations around prices, which we already see happening, as their real incomes catch up. And I think that's the key. So look, time has to pass. Um, I'm not saying time heals all, but time backed by favorable economic trends, uh, I think uh, will eventually improve some of those sentiments given what, what folks have been through. And then, as I said, if you actually ask people about our specific policies, they're, they're a lot more favorable than the broad uh, polls would suggest. Jared Bernstein, the chair of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors. Always good to have you on. Appreciate the time today. Great talking. Bye-bye. Well, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
fuel prices jumping today, erasing their recent drop. And it comes amid a show of unity by world's top two exporters, Russia and Saudi Arabia. They've committed to extra cuts and long said the move will help balance the market. Now, they should act as a tailwind for the price of crude, along with the impact of Israel's war with Hamas. But can't discount fears over so-called demand destruction as fears of an economic slowdown continue to rattle the market. Let's bring in Tamar Esner, Vectis Energy Partners Principal, to break all this down for us. Tamar, good to talk to you today. Uh, we did get EIA data out today pointing to a significant crude buildup, the biggest buildup we've seen since February. What does that mean in terms of prices? Well, I think that prices are really discounting what's going on in Ukraine and really sort of gotten back to the fundamentals. And at least as of now, with the situation in, in Israel and, and Hamas, and then obviously Ukraine and Russia, fundamentally, markets haven't really changed that much. So really, we're looking at access to crude oil from from Saudi Arabia's perspective is being um, crimped um, access to um, uh, capital in the form of higher interest rates is being crimped. So at some point, that's going to start to have an impact on uh, the global economy. And you're starting to see that in the US um, and other countries around the world, demand is slowing down. And as a result of that, to your point, Akiko inventories are, are building up. Uh, let's going to get back to the fundamentals, but let's talk about what's playing out between Israel and Hamas. Obviously, we saw that initial spike on the back of uh, the fighting breaking out over the weekends. And yet, as you point out, we're kind of right back to where we were before that. Um, what do you think would change the dynamic from, from an oil perspective and the current fighting right now? What would bring it back to the market in terms of a risk factor? Is it really about this regional conflict? beyond Israel and Hamas? Yeah, so certainly a, a threat to physical supply. So if Iran were to get involved more directly, um, if Israel were to attack Ar Iran, um, Iran obviously has been exporting more onto the market as um, the U.S. has sort of turned a blind eye to sanctions. Obviously, Iran also controls the Straits of, of Hormuz, which accounts for anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of global oil consumption passes through the Straits. So that would be, uh, you know, an extremely uh, high uh, source of risk into the market. We're talking, you know, oil prices going up in five to ten dollar increments for every day that that those risks that that those supply disruptions were going on. Um, but basically, there's there's so many uh, push pull factors in the market right now. Certainly, the the, the supply risks are all very bullish. But um, as we look on on concerns about the economy, those are, are very bearish sources of concern. And so, as a result of that, the market's actually sort of found some stability amid all the the confusion and the complexity. Um, traders are just sort of saying, we're going to wait and see until there's actual um, changes on the ground. Yeah, that demand picture certainly contributing to a rapid decline in oil prices we saw prior to this fighting breaking out over in Israel. Um, it, you know, the, the question I keep asking, it, the demand picture right now, and then you look at the production cuts from the Saudis and Russia, do they, do they match? I mean, it, does, does the production cuts that we're seeing is it justified by the demand that we're seeing? That's a great question. I actually think that that Saudi in particular, and to some extent Russia as well, um, have been very focused on, on future demand. So demand here and now has actually been uh, quite robust. Um, and I think that the Saudis are sort of trying to, pro at least up until this situation with uh, Hamas and Israel, the Saudis were sort of prophylactically trying to manage for concerns about a slowdown in Chinese demand. Um, the Chinese have spent most of the year building up their oil inventory. Um, and so even if there is just a, a mild slowdown in China, they, they have plenty of domestic inventories to draw, draw off from. So they don't really have to be importing as much oil. And that would sort of um, lessen oil imports and sort of put a lid on, on oil demand. So I think to your point, actually demand, you know, in the here and now has actually been quite good. And um, there has been some some, you know, demand destruction, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, gasoline uh, consumption in the U.S. Is, has been lower um, in the summer season than we otherwise would have expected. Um, but overall, demand has been sort of steady as she goes. Um, and I think that Saudi has not been happy with the oil prices um, despite that. And so they've sort of tried to get ahead of what they see as potential problems next year by, by cutting oil production now.
And Tamar, you talked about balance starting to return to the market. Does that quiet some of those calls that we got from the likes of Citi and Goldman about this march towards $100 a barrel? Well, right now, any scenario is is possible. And let's not, um, you know, while we're all focused squarely and, and rightly so on the situation, the war between Israel and, and Hamas, um, you know, there's also the war with Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, we are not totally discounting the the possibility that Putin could weaponize oil going into into the winter in terms of uh, cutting off uh, oil oil exports um, we've seen them we've seen them do that with with natural gas so um, it, it's a really difficult market to predict from a fundamental perspective I think that oil could sort of trade in a like 80 to 100 dollar range i think saudi has a lot of spare capacity so if oil were to really move past 100 dollars they they'd really be worried about demand destruction and they have plenty of oil to to bring back so i think that the market's really focused on the fact that saudi uae and others have uh, so much spare spare uh, production capacity and sort of that's also um, putting a lid on on prices Okay, we'll be watching to see which direction it moves from our Esmer Vectus Energy Partners principal. Good to talk to you today. Thank you, Kiko. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, how much more are you willing to spend on a burrito? Chipotle is upping their prices again. This is the fourth time in just two years the company raising their prices. More on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma is here to break it down for us. Um, Brooke, you know, Chipotle is an interesting story because they were among the first, if not the first, to raise prices as we saw this push 
for inflation. Um, but the company sort of said earlier this year they were going to pause that. What has changed? Yeah, Kiko. Well, certainly the company said that they were keeping a close eye on the cost of ingredients over the past year. And now they're sharing a similar tone. A spokesperson telling Yahoo Finance that for the first time in over a year, we will be taking a modest price increase to offset inflation. Now, once again, Chipotle had raised prices throughout 2022. Then they announced a pause on plans earlier this year. But this comes after CFO Jack Hardtongue had weighed in on that pause in a Yahoo Finance interview back in April. Take a listen. In our case, we don't have any plans to take any price increases. We're going to watch what happens with all of our ingredients, not just, you know, if some goes, uh, you know, go up, hopefully some will go down. Now, Akiko, here's what changed. In July, when the company reported in the last quarter, it missed on same source sales estimates, and that sent uh, uh, shares to plunge in after hours trading following that report. And in their earnings call, Brian Nickel said, you know, he, he sort of somewhat hinted at a potential price hike. He said that the brand is very strong, the value proposition is very strong, and he said that we have that pricing power to use. Now, there's no word yet on how much exactly Chipotle will raise prices or when they will raise prices. But one analyst that I spoke to, Andrew Charles of TD Cowan, he said that TD Cowan believes that the price increase will go into effect halfway through Q4, and it could be a price increase of 3%. But once again, that certainly remains unknown when or how much that will go into effect. But certainly uh, Chipotle thinking twice about that pause on price hikes. Yeah, something to watch to see whether, in fact, consumers are willing to shell out a little more, even in this environment. Of course, this comes just two weeks before Chipotle is expected to report its Q3, Q3 earnings. Uh, what are analysts looking for? Yeah, city analyst John Tower saying in a note that he really is keeping a close eye on a few key topics, one of them being progress on customer scores and throughput. So when you think about those long lines outside the store, how much can a Chipotle store uh, fulfill those orders? How fast can they fulfill those orders? And how can they get those happy customers out the door? He also is waiting for an update on those grill. Last quarter, they said that they would expand the test of a grill upgrade to 10 more units following the second quarter. And also, as you noted before, we're looking for any signs of pushback to these higher prices over the past year, over the past quarter, especially uh, from customers. If they're done putting up with these higher prices at Chipotle, especially ahead of this another uh, price increase. And also, and, uh, John Tower taking a closer look at the relationship between margins and, and uh, average unit volumes here. Certainly, Chipotle continues to increase its unit growth. They're eyeing those 7,000 stores. And so really, with Chipotle being at the top end of the industry in terms of just the unit growth ambition, analysts are keeping a close watch on that as well. Okay, and I know you will be as well. Brooke De Palma, thanks so much for that. Well, inflation data out this morning coming in slightly higher than expected for the month of September. CPI rose 3.7% year over year. You combine that with the recent strong jobs data, that's fueling fears the Fed may raise interest rates one more time this year. Jennifer Lee, BMO senior economist, uh, here to break it down for us. Uh, good to talk to you today. Any real surprises for you in the CPI print we got today? Well, hi there. And by the way, I'll just talk about burritos. I'm really hungry right now. Um, so <laughs> there, the overall, it was like a little bit above expected, but uh, not shockingly so. I was a little bit worried, to be quite frank, um, after yesterday's producer price report, which uh, was well above expected. But overall, but um, you know, the headline, the core, not too far of expectations. I think what was kind of surprising was the when you break it down into uh, not just goods and services, which is what we have to do these days, but also the super core measure, which it jumped uh, 0.6% in the month or the estimate of super core. And that is going to, I think, keep the Fed on its toes. Um, the way, you know, of course, we had jobs growth uh, um, last week, uh, also much stronger than expected, but at least the wages component was coming down. So I don't think there's anything that's going to um, cause the Fed to look around and say, hey, should we be rethinking everything that we've been thinking about? Um, but, you know, there's still one more key report that has to come out um, at the end of the month on personal spending. And I think that's going to make this decision. But overall, I think the whole, you know, high, uh, high for longer theme is still going to play out. Yeah, looking at super core uh, inflation, as you point out, something the Fed's increasingly looking at right now. Um, how concerned are you that those prices, those levels could be sustained? 
So that is definitely the worry. But again, you would think that in theory, after 525 basis points of rate hikes, you know, you're going to start seeing that downward pressure on inflation start kicking in. And then it has for sure. But it's just that we've, we've hit almost like this little, um, um, it's not really a bottom, but now we're sort of bouncing around a little bit at this point. Um, you know, the Fed chairman himself said that the easy part was going down from, uh, you know, from those 40, four decade highs down to, you know, roughly 3% and the hard part is going down from three to 2%. So I think we're probably going to start seeing some, you know, um, some little bit of more pressure coming from the inflation front and before we start seeing it heading back down toward that two percent target so we expect you know um you know all things playing out we expect things to or at least inflation to have some sort of a two handle um towards the end of next year yeah and looking at the market reaction today uh, no real significant moves on the back of this inflation print you could argue part of that is because of what we have seen uh, among bond yields we have seen that credit tightening yields pushing up again after pulling back just slightly does that outweigh some of the data that we're seeing right now? I mean, sort of put your put yourself in, in the Fed's shoes as you look at the economic picture and the concerns here in terms of trying to maintain that soft landing. Has the yield story taken over? It has taken over in the sense that it's helped the Fed. It's almost made the Fed's job a little bit easier. So instead of deciding, you know, we're going to all going to to raise rates further, you know, it's, you know, I think they mentioned that during in the minutes, you know, they said, um, how how long will they stay up there instead of how high do we have to go? Some subtle nuances there, I guess. But you know, with bond yields uh, selling off or bonds selling off over the past or, or two weeks ago, I guess at this point, um, keeping bond yields high, the market is tightening up a little bit, and again, is doing the Fed's work a little bit uh, for it, helping it out a bit, um, and of course, watching the data very carefully, seeing still some upward pressures on the consumer price front and the producer price front, still lots of volatility given all these major global events that we're seeing playing out. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not an easy job. And when you talk about, you know, putting myself in their shoes, those are huge shoes to fill. I do not envy anyone on that uh, on that policy making committee. Yeah, I don't think anybody's throwing up their hand right now to try and get on the FOMC right now. But when you think about where things have tracked the economic data, you know, yes, we have seen sort of, uh, you know, inflation so elevated, but sort of moving in the right direction. Um, what do you think would change the course for the Fed? In other words, sort of thinking about that additional rate hike. Yes, they've said publicly optionality remains, but increasingly the expectation is that they're essentially done right now, but keeping rates where they are. Right. So. I think it's, uh, and by the way, and, and I've been kind of guilty of saying that they are now on the sidelines. And I guess you, you can't really say that they're really on the sidelines until because it's only been one meeting, really. Um, but I think it would take um, more data pointing to upward pressure on prices, um, more data pointing to a resilient uh, U.S. consumer, and as long as you know the jobs are plentiful, you know consumers are going to be staying in a in a healthy position, which is not a bad thing at all. And of course, watching um, energy prices, uh, which are not at least back up to their peaks that we saw earlier this year, so that's comforting, I guess. Um, but also watching inflation expectations, and um, and if we start if they start seeing that pushing higher again, I think they're going to have to start ramping up some of that hawkish rhetoric. But at the same time, you know, like raising rates one more time versus keeping them high at these levels, you know, there's there's there are some, you know, differences, but at the same time, we're not talking about like another campaign of more and more rate hikes. BMO senior economist Jennifer Lee joining us there. I appreciate your insight. Thank you. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Google is out with its latest updates and its second release of its Pixel Watch, but is it better than the original? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley to give us his insights. Dan, I was going to say the sequel is rarely better than the original. Ooh. Is that the case in this? Well, when it comes to tech, usually the sequel's the the better one. Um, I will also say that uh, Star Wars. Uh, the Empire Strikes Back is a better sequel, but you know I'll just leave that <laughs> at that. Uh, as far as the the Pixel Watch goes, though, uh, I have it here. This is the Pixel Watch Two. Uh, it's the as you said, second generation of Google's smartwatch. Uh, it carries over many of the same features, but addresses some of the the shortcomings of the original. So the sequel here is actually better. Uh, one of the shortcomings that uh, the original watch had was performance wasn't exactly great, but with this newer version, which starts at three forty nine, uh, you can see that the uh, actual interface is very sleek, very quick. Uh, there aren't any kinds of slowdown at all when you're going through your apps. Uh, it's just nice and simple, uh, very smooth. Um, I particularly like it for its design. Uh, obviously, I also have an Apple Watch here, and you can see that uh, the Apple Watch is square. Well, this guy goes with a, a little rounded domed design. This is something that uh, is somewhat unique to Google. Uh, there are other smartwatches that are round, but this has got that rounded dome design. I think it's got a, a better overall look um, for uh, the kind of aesthetic you might be going for if you have uh, a smartwatch or you just want to stand out and don't want to have a rectangle on your wrist like everyone else on the face of the earth. Um, there are some big changes outside of just that processor, which improves performance. There's also a new heart rate sensor underneath, and it does do a lot of good. It actually allows it to capture more information than the prior version. There's uh, usually four lights or five lights right there. It's a multi-path uh, kind of device. And so it'll more accurately, accurately track your heart rate. And because Google purchased Fitbit, Fitbit is a big part of this as well. So you would go into the Fitbit app and be able to get all of your information, whether that's your, how many steps you walk, how often you worked out this week. Uh, if you sign up for Fitbit Premium, uh, you also get six months of that for free. You'll get what's called a readiness score. Basically, what that does is it takes into account your sleep, your exercise, uh, and how much you generally were active and let you know, hey, you can go out and work out today or maybe take it easy, hang out on the couch, have a few beers. It probably won't tell you to have beers, but that's the advice that I take from it. Uh, the other uh, big changes that you'll notice uh, is that this also has a temperature sensor. Uh, so it'll be able to track temperature during sleep, uh, provide you information uh, related to that. And then it also uh, provides you with just general overall exercises. So again, if you sign up for Fit for Premium, you get some good exercise programs in there. Uh, essentially what this is doing is replicating the experience of a Fitbit, but with Apple, uh, excuse me, Google hardware. And when it comes to Apple, they have a similar experience on the Apple Watch. Although this guy starts at 349, the Apple Watch starts at 399. I think if you're looking for an Android smartwatch uh, and you don't necessarily want to go with the Samsung, this is honestly my favorite Android smartwatch on the market. Uh, I love the design. I think it's well built um, and the battery life will get you through the whole day. It's not going to get you multiple days, though. That's something that smart watchmakers still need to get around to. Um, Dan, I have to say, I was one of those that initially resisted having a square on my wrist. I, I have warmed up to it over the years. But, I mean, you've got dueling wrists right now, right? I mean, at the end of the day, is it worth getting out of the ecosystem? If you're already in iOS, do you switch over? Is it good I enough mean, well, to switch over? Uh, I, I switch over all the time for you know work. I have to switch over from Android to iOS and iOS to Android. I just made the switch yesterday back to, to iOS uh, only because I own a, a Apple Watch. I think for the general user, a smartwatch isn't going to be the thing that gets you to change. Um, it's going to be the thing that gets you to stick, which is why I went back to iOS because this is my own uh, uh, Apple Watch Series 8. So I think that if... If you're looking to change or you're interested in changing, do the smartphone route first and then go for the smartphones. Uh, they, uh, excuse me, smartphone uh, route and then go for the smartwatch. Google just announced uh, their new Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro uh, smartphones. They're very, very impressive devices, tons of AI built into them. You know, whether or not it's going to be a game changer down the line as far as the AI goes, 
that kind of remains to be seen. The, the photo features are very interesting. They have great cameras on them. So I think that's where you're going to start if you're trying to change from ecosystem to ecosystem. And then you would want to go out and get the watch. But if you are on Android, uh, honestly, this is my favorite watch to go for. I just love the design. And look, the the, the heart rate sensor is so accurate that, you know, I was riding my little stationary bike uh, and it kept tracking, you know, up and down as my heart rate went uh, going through exercises. Okay. Um, exercise bikes are terrible, by the way. We need to add that to the video, Dan, you with the watch Ooh. on your exercise bike. Okay, that's for the next review. Dan Halley, as always, with those reviews, thanks so much for that. Well, electric vehicles already account for 8% of new car sales in the U.S., but a new report says the number is expected to more than double in part because of federal incentives. S&P Global forecasts EV sales to surpass 4.6 million by the end of the decade, even as drivers raise concerns about the range and cost of cars. One association trying to drive more EV change in U.S. policy is the Zero Emission Transportation Association, better known as Zeta, an industry-backed coalition advocating for full adoption of EVs by 2030. Let's bring in Zero Emission Transportation Association Executive Director, Al Gore the Third. It's good to talk to you today. Um, you know, we're at what, nearly 10% adoption right now. You could argue that first 10% is always a little easier. What's the key driver to get to 20%? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Akiko. Great to be here. Um, I, I would argue maybe the 10 first 10% is, is the hardest when we're talking about a new technology. Um, but I think we're moving beyond the early adopters, and that's a that's an important point. The last two years have been uh, the most productive in terms of uh, public policy regarding electric vehicles in in our history. The bipartisan infrastructure law included billions of dollars for a national electric vehicle charging network to the NEVI program. Those funds are being sent out to states now. Uh, last year, the Inflation Reduction Act included enormous manufacturing and consumer incentives. And there's a, a an intense focus now on upstream supply chain for minerals and batteries. And all of that is going to bring a lot of jobs into the United States and, uh, and of course, drive further adoption. But I think just last week, we had guidance uh, on transferability of the credits, which mm -hmm. will uh, create on the hood uh, incentives for uh, consumers and really simplify the process. And that's going to be great for the entire auto industry, uh, dealers and consumers uh, together. So a lot of work still to be done, but uh, the pace is really accelerating very quickly. You look at the key hurdles to adoption, and there are many, but the key ones being cost and then range anxiety slash infrastructure. On the cost side, the $7,500 federal incentive that comes through from the IRA, how much of that has pushed drivers towards EVs? What are you seeing on that front? Well, I think it's been really significant in expanding access to electric vehicles for folks who are in the market for a new car. Uh, there are many electric vehicles that are below the average price of a new vehicle in the United States and, and well under it now. I think... Uh, it's it's been really important. It's it's tied to a uh, to North American Assembly, so it's also been uh, a, an incentive for companies to invest here for final vehicle assembly, um, as well as battery manufacturing. So that's that's been an enormous co benefit as well. But I think that as more people have experience with electric vehicles uh, and know people, friends, and colleagues, and neighbors. Who have their own experiences, um, it's it's a lot easier to answer the basic questions of how this new type of vehicle is going to fit into my life. And with regard to charging infrastructure, again, Nevi is is putting uh, seven point five billion dollars into the construction of a national electric vehicle charging network. We've already got an enormous private network. We've we've now uh, mm -hmm. seen an opening of the Tesla network. Uh, which is going to have an enormous impact. Um, but in in uh, in practice, most charging, about 80% takes place overnight where folks are parked or where they're parked at work. And that's a really huge focus is getting charging installed where folks are parked 
um, because then you're coming back to a, a full battery every time you get into the vehicle. This push towards electrification, of course, is a global race that we're seeing right now. If you consider the, the federal goal here being roughly 50% adoption by the end of this decade, um, do we have the resources and the parts in place to make that happen, considering you've got China, you've got European countries, I mean, you've got a global push to move in the same direction? The answer is yes, we do. It's going to take work. and. That's where the focus on the upstream supply chain is really, really important. So we need to move a lot more quickly in creating new sources of minerals, new processing capacity, new battery manufacturing capacity. I think currently there is uh, a, a global supply chain um, outside of China even, but you know everybody is working to build, expand, and secure their supply chains among our trusted trade partners um, and, and, and grow this manufacturing capacity here as quickly as possible. We do have the resources to do it. It's going to take effort, and that effort is well underway. There have been tens of billions of dollars invested in upstream capacity uh, since the passage of the IRA, and it's going to bear fruit over the next you know, several decades. Okay, it's going to be an all-out push there to move in that direction. Zero Emission Transportation Association Executive Director Albert Gore III. It's good to talk to you today. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Well, Hollywood Studios and SAG After Actors have hit a bump in the road yet again to negotiating a deal to end the ongoing strike. Talks were suspended yesterday after failing to come to an agreement over key issues like streaming, viewership, and artificial intelligence. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal, who's been keeping tabs on this. Ali, what's the next step now? Mm, that's to be determined. And right now we have a significant setback in these negotiations. The AMPTP, which does bargain on behalf of studios, including Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, even Netflix, they released a statement late last night saying that the gap between the two sides was just too great to continue negotiations. One of the biggest sticking points here is over something that SAG proposed called a viewership bonus. Now, the structure of this bonus, according to the studios, would cost these companies more than $800 million per per year and create, quote, an, an untenable economic burden at a time when media companies are just strapped for cash and with the exception of Netflix, are bleeding money on the streaming side. The studio said it did make a list of other types of concessions, such as a success-based streaming residual and several AI protections. But the actors fought back, saying that they didn't really see any meaningful protections surrounding the role of artificial intelligence and that there also weren't significant uh, wage increases in that proposal. In a post on X, the union wrote, quote, the companies are using the same failed strategy they tried to inflict on the WGA, putting out misleading information in an attempt to fool our members into abandoning our solidarity and putting pressure on our negotiators. But just like the writers, our members are smarter than that and will not be fooled. So some fighting words there, basically threatening to stay on the picket lines for as long as it takes. And you have to remember the timeline of all of this. SAG after they're about to enter month three on their strike. The writers, they were on the picket lines for nearly five months until they were able to reach a deal. So you have to think how long both sides can really withstand to not be at work and for Hollywood to be on pause. Because at the end of the day, you are talking about people's livelihoods, people's jobs. And then on the studio side, if they're not able to provide content, that's going to affect subscriber numbers and profitability. So the stakes are really high for both sides here, and certainly the fact that we have a pause once again in these negotiations, a very big setback. Yeah, and we're talking about mid-October right now, so there's just mm -hmm. a few more months left to go in the year. Ali Canal staying on top of those negotiations for us. Thanks so much. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. Uh, trading pretty flat right now. When you look at all three majors, the Dow is down about 58 points, the S&P 500 flat, and the Nasdaq up 29. Uh, the market, this uh, trading, this fight, um, or reacting to, we should say, uh, that inflation trend that we got this morning, uh, pointing to just a touch hotter than expected price increases in September. That does it for me in this hour. But we've got much more to come here on Yahoo Finance Live. Keep it right here.